are you guys doing? Are you excited? Ah, come on. I'm excited, right? This is kind of what I do. It's not just install training, but it's sales training. It's it's R and R centric, and everybody knows what R and R is, right? It's not rest and relaxation. It's not Roadrunner. It's not all this other stuff that everybody thinks I do. Um, it's remodel and replace, replacement, remodel. You go to Thermature Corporate, we have a million different names for that. If we say R and R, nobody knows what that actually is, which is kind of weird. Um, but. My whole goal today is to try and take the install process or even the door process and make it something that is much easier to understand. For whatever reason, there is this massive misconception that doors are extremely difficult. And I think the majority of that comes from the cost of a door, right? How often are we shopping for a door? Ever? Once, twice, maybe. And if we do, what do we usually expect it to be? What the box stores advertise, right? We advertise a lot of very entry-level doors, right? What's on the shelf? That's what everybody assumes that a door is, is to be. Not saying there's anything wrong with it. It's just that that's not the door for everyone, right? Which if anyone's ever looked at our full-line catalog, it's 300 pages of doors, right? We have something for everyone, not everything for everyone, but at least there's something for your style. That's why it's so big. That's all Thermatrue does is entry doors. And we're, we're the innovator of, of fiberglass. We've been doing it since 1982, right? So we have this huge breadth of offering. So there's a lot of fear factors that go into that. So we want to try and curve some of that today. So first thing I always like to start with, the installers that are in the room or the service managers or whatever we, we may have in the room, what is the average time frame for installing, say, that single door right there? And when I say installing, I mean complete. So you're removing the old unit and you're replacing it with the new door. What is the average time frame? It depends a lot, doesn't it? Because I mean, if you look at the bottom of any contract, any sales contract, what does it say? Unforeseen damage, yada, yada, there might be extra charges. I mean, all this stuff, because you never know until you rip it out what you're gonna find. It's kind of like opening Pandora's box, right? You never know what you're gonna find inside that wall. Usually there's a reason why they're replacing the door and usually it's because it's rotten or doesn't function right, which, God, it could be a multitude of things that is causing that to happen. So we don't know yet. How long does it take to install a, a replacement window? It's usually pretty quick. You can usually do maybe four or so in an hour, five. If you're really good, you might be able to do six or seven if you're really good with a break, right? So when I talk to a lot of window installers, that's the first thing they tell me was, well, heck, I can install four or five windows in the same time frame it takes me to install a door. And I make more money that way. Well, that's a problem for me, right? Because I don't want you to feel that way. It shouldn't be much different than a window. It is a little bit, but it shouldn't be that much, right? <clears throat> so the first thing I want to start talking about is what is the number one, in your opinion, the number one fear factor behind a door? What is the number one thing that if you, if you make a mistake on, it's not going to work, and there's no going back, there's no fixing it, there's no adjusting it, there's no nothing. What is the number one thing? Measuring. Measuring. Size, right? Size of the opening, size of the existing door, size of the new door, right? That is the number one thing, and I, you guys have all been in the industry long enough. We love the word standard, right? <laughs> There's standard everything. Every, every, every customer walks in and says, I need that standard window, or I need that standard. What, what standard window? There is no standard, right? Everybody has a different size, and, and we do that for a reason, <laughs> but it adds complexity to the, to the situation, right? So measuring is that first key step. Measuring is that first big fear factor. So this is coming out of what's called R&R Accelerator. ORPAC participated in this. This is a, a Thermatrue promoted program. The whole point of this program, guys, is to try and simplify the door process. The R&R Accelerator program is nothing more than that, right? We want to take a lot of that fear off the table. We want to make sure that you guys are comfortable and we're going to provide you with some tools to make that easier. Once you get the hang of this form, you probably will never need it again, except for maybe a reference tool. But I want you to fully, fully understand this. So if there's ever any questions, especially at this part, this is what I want you guys to start asking me about as we go through this, because I need you to fully grasp this concept, okay? There are two dimensions in doors that have never changed since the dawn of time. Does anybody want to guess what those might be? What's that? What would you say? 
Rough opening, width and height. No, rough opening changes because, well, framers are framers and they really don't care, right? They'll throw whatever up and as long as they're bigger than whatever's been spec to go in there, they're happy, right? And width and height, unfortunately, changes from manufacturer to manufacturer. Thermatrue is one of the most guilty parties of that um, because Thermatrue has controlled roughly 36% of the new construction market across the country for eons, right? Architects came to us and said, hey, we want a true 36 inch wide by 80 inch high opening. Well, if you know anything about doors, you know that a normal or a traditional, I'm trying to stay away from that other word, <laughs> um, door is much smaller than that. It's actually a half inch narrower and a quarter inch, uh, half inch shorter and a quarter inch narrower, right? So Thermatrue actually exploded our door units. We grew a half inch in, in height and a quarter inch in width, which makes us, what? Bigger than everybody else. So when you get to R&R, &R, we're already at a, a losing end, right? Because we're already taller. Taller is where it makes a big difference. You get an extra half inch to the header, you don't always have that, right? So Thermatrue is very guilty of that. You had your hand up. The door width, the, thickness of the, the, doors changed. the thickness of the slab or the thickness of like, the frame. You were saying that what happened changed? Yep. And that's the door thickness. Door thickness. So, so door thickness, yes, it, it, it hasn't changed tremendously, but it does vary from manufacturer to manufacturer, but by, by minute dimensions. Unfortunately, the door thickness, the slab thickness, or the panel thickness, if this one will open, this isn't going to help us in determining what size this door is, right? Anybody else? Jam thickness or jam size, right? So what I mean by that is this profile here, or we'll use this side, or this profile here, okay? These two dimensions have been consistent forever and ever and ever. If it's not, it's very obvious. It's either an interior door that's being used as an exterior door, which is obvious, right? Or it's a custom built door on site and it looks really funny. Weather stripping looks funny. It doesn't look anything like this when it's installed or anything like those when they're installed, right? It's very obvious that it's not this style. If it's any, anything that looks anywhere remotely similar to this, these dimensions have not changed, ever. The great thing about that is we can utilize that, right, when we're measuring. So in-home sales, when you go out to measure a window or a door or whatever the case may be, what's the last thing you want to do? Remove something? Remove casing, right? Why? Well, if you remove the casing nine times out of ten, it's going to break. And now you've made the customer mad and you haven't even given them a quote. Right? And they're already extremely upset at you and they're probably not going to buy from you. Right? And it always happens on the extremely old homes, which has this ornate trim, which you can't replace because you can't find it. They don't make it anymore. Right? So we want to be extremely careful on removing things. Now there, are, there is a point where you do want to remove it, but you want to make sure that you've got them sold first. Right? But to be able to get them sold, you have to have some kind of a general idea of what size that product is. Because if you don't, how are you to price it? You can't, right? Because what if it's a custom unit? Okay? So, utilizing what, what we know about the frame and utilizing that tool that's in front of you, that sheet that's in front of you, we can come up with a way to do this, basically having x-ray vision and being able to see inside the wall without removing anything. Okay? So, I'm going to follow the sheet first and I'm going to tell you another way um, that's not on the sheet, but you can write it on there and you can utilize it this way too because there might be a scenario where you may not be able to see this first way of explaining it. If you were to go inside the door or inside the home, okay, and find this inside profile or this inside lip, this one here, your door slab closes into here, right? So if you open the door, it's visible. It's this portion here or this portion here. Follow what I'm saying? You can take your tape measure. 
This one has side lights, so it's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just pretend it doesn't have side lights right now, all right? Just, they don't exist right now. You can go inside here, and you go from side to side. You can take that dimension and write it on that first line there, the blunt first blank line on the front, and it says to add what to that? Inch and a half. Where do you think that comes from? This frame piece, right? Each one of these is three quarters of an inch. And we're dealing with two of them because we have two jam legs. So each one of these is three quarters of an inch. So three quarters plus three quarters is an inch and a half. So if we add an inch and a half to that dimension that we just measured, guess what? We just saw exactly where that unit stops inside the wall. It doesn't mean that the jack stud is not three inches over. Follow what I'm saying? We don't know where that jack stud is, the, the main framing of the wall. We don't know where that is yet. But what we do know is there's a door in there now, and it measures that width. So if we order another door at that width, guess what? It's going to fit, right? Why? Well, there's one there now that's that size, OK? <clears throat> if it has side lights, like this unit, what do you do? Do you measure here, and then try and measure here, and then try and measure the other one? No, please don't do that. Because what is, what is the great thing about side lights? The invent of side lights allows us flexibility on sizing, right? So these mall posts, does everybody know what I mean when I say back-to-back -back jam? Back-to-back -back jam is taking basically two of these and putting them back-to-back -back on each other. Okay, so you got the panel on this side and the side light on this side, or the door slab on this side, the side light on this side, but you have two of these. And guess what we can do there? No different than a window. We can start to spread this, okay, to take up and make whatever size we need to fit that opening. So what if somebody has done that here, and there's covers on it? You can't see how much is in there, right? We don't want to guess. Or do we want to guess? No. We don't want to guess. Never, ever guess. So when it has side lights, you go to the outer two most legs and you do the same thing. Find that, that profile, the inside profile, take your tape measure on the inside, lay it all the way across, ignoring these. They don't exist. You're going all the way to the outside two legs and you're still going to add what? Inch and a half because we're still only dealing with two because we are, have already encompassed these with our tape measure, whatever these may be. I don't care what these are because we're already measuring across them. Make sense? So no matter what it is, I don't care if it's five panels across, ignore everything in the center. You want the outer two most legs, and that's all you want to pay attention to. OK? Clear as mud? All right. What about height? Same exact thing. But there's one thing that you want to make sure that you're paying attention to, and that's the sill. OK? There's a couple different scenarios that can throw you for a loop here. The one thing that I want you to just grind in your mind is you always have to find bottom. Why? Because unlike a replacement window, for the most part, everything is coming out. Okay? I get a lot of installers or sales guys that will do this. They'll try and follow that sheet, but they lay their tape measure on top of the sill. And they come up here and they do the same thing. Is that an issue? Yes, because now we're basically leaving the sill and we're getting a false measurement. So always find bottom. If it's a traditional setup like this particular door here, you can actually hook your tape measure on the bottom of the sill on the inside or the outside. You can come up to the same profile, do the exact same thing, but we're only going to add three quarters because <laughs> we're dealing with one jam leg. The half inch is rough opening. So we're on the next yeah. section. Um, we're going to add 3 quarters because we're only dealing with one jam leg now instead of two. Okay. What if there's a transom? Treat the transom no differently than you would the side light. So basically, a transom is a side light. It's just turned on its side. right? So you bypass this one, and you go to the very top, and you do the exact same thing. Add 3 quarters. Make sense? The scenario that I always get thrown out, thrown out at me 
is what if there's a concrete stoop and some genius concrete guy poured a new stoop and it's level with the threshold? What do you do? Because you can't find bottom anymore, right? You can't get down to this point, right? Especially if there's a hardwood floor inside and it's three quarter inch thick, you can't find bottom anymore. What do you do? Well, what you should do, you need to think outside the box a little bit. What does that mean for the home if there's now a new concrete stoop out here and this sill is sitting down inside of a pocket? The concrete's now higher than the face of that sill. What does that mean for the house? Water's coming in. There's no stopping it. Because what is the sill designed to do? Make water run away from the unit. So if it's now level here, where's it going? Well, it's gonna find that seam, it's gonna drop down, and it's gonna come into the house because it has nowhere else to go, okay? So as a sales team, install team, whatever the case may be, you wanna make sure that that door now is gonna be reset to the, where it's supposed to be. So that concrete that's right here is now our bottom. So we utilize that concrete and do the same thing, which means we're gonna have to custom make the door, the door's gonna have to be cut down to fit that opening more than likely. The other way, there is a different dimension here. Um, so instead of three quarters, what did I say the other one was? This one? Inch and a quarter, okay? Always been an inch and a quarter. So the other one, so this is, this is the other scenario. Outside the door, you will always be able to see these jam legs, always. Even if there's a storm door on it, even if there's flat stock on it, I don't care what's on the outside of that house or the outside of that door, those will always be visible, okay? Same exact scenario, same principle, same measurements, it's just you're outside. So you go from here to here, which this particular one is 65 and a half, and you're gonna add two and a half, you're an inch and a quarter each leg, inch and a quarter, inch and a quarter, you're gonna add two and a half inches, get you the same exact dimension, your actual unit size. Do the same thing in height, just like we covered before. The only difference is you're dealing with an inch and a quarter per leg instead of three quarters. All right, is there any other dimension that we need? Wall thickness, how do we determine that? Front to back, where at? Wherever you can get a tape to measure from. Okay. And that's a, that's a very valid point. If it's a single door, you could probably do it here, right? Because the single door, that jam leg has to be the wall depth. If it's a door with side lights, this is what I always get from everyone. I open the door and I measure across here all the time. Well, great. What if you have what's called a narrow mall where this mall post does not come out to the edge of the jam leg? Like, this one does. I don't think, no, we don't have any that don't. But if you had a narrow mall, which only comes out to about here, can you still do that? <laughs> no, right, you're gonna be wrong, okay? I know we hate reaching above our heads. It's always the best bet, and it's the safest bet, and you'll always be right if you open the door and use the header. Always, 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 I don't care if there's a transom up here or not. This header piece will always be your wall depth. Always, even if there's a transom, okay? Because a header does what? What is a header, what's the purpose? The header distributes the weight across the unit and down to the legs or down to the support system, right? No different than a header in a wall. It's all designed to do that. So it has to be a structural member. So it has to be that dimension, okay? Reach above you, take your measurement, go from inside to outside, excluding any and all trim. And I call trim brick mold, flat stock, casing, whatever you want to call it, that's all trim. It's aesthetics. It has no function to the door short of aesthetics, right? You'll always be able to see this jam leg. You'll always be able to see where it stops and starts. So that's where you want to measure every single time, okay? Is there ever an instance that, that you need to take more than one dimension? or one measurement. Not necessarily wall depth, but maybe on width. Should you be taking more than one? Yes. Why? The opening's not always plumb. What about the door? Right? 
What about installers? We, we have this great new invent called an impact gun, right? I hate impact guns. <laughs> I, I really like impact guns, but for certain things. For installation, impact guns should never be used, and they're used all the time. So impact guns, what, what do they do? What's the purpose behind them? They have a lot more power. They're supposed to be easier to control, which no, they're not. Um, but what will happen is they'll banana the frames, right? If they banana the frames and you take one measurement here, because this is where everyone likes to, to measure from, because it's the easiest. They don't have to bend over or reach above their head. More than likely, if that's been bowed at all, that's where it's gonna show up, right? My recommendation is always top, middle, bottom on width. I would always, you're, you're fine with a single measurement here, but then I would do the same thing on your height, left, center, right, because you never know what someone has done or not done, okay? So three on width, three on height, one across the top. Make sense? Okay, so we covered width, height of the unit, jam depth. Is there anything else that we should be paying attention to at this point? Whether it's for sales or whether it's for installs or anything else that we should be paying attention to. Handing, swing. How do we hand a door? Were you raising your hand? No? <laughs> Outside looking in, anybody else? Come on, there's gotta be more answers than that. Yeah, how do, how do you tell the handing of a door? We've got some smart folks over here in California. So here, here's the deal, guys. I, my second class yesterday, I actually had one person in there that said the same thing. That is exactly how I teach to do it, and I'm gonna tell you why. Thermatrue doesn't like this, that I do this, but well, too bad. Thermatrue has our own way of handing a door. Every other door manufacturer has their own way of handing a door, right? Everyone tries to make it extremely difficult on you, which creates a fear factor. Yeah, the great show, Fear Factor, right? It, create, it, it scares you, because what do you do? If you, if you mess up the handing, can you fix it? No. no, what does that mean? It's a new door, and if you ordered this door pre-finished and it's $8,000, who's gonna eat it? Hmm. When I was selling, I was, right? So, your way is the best way. Open the door, put your butt against the hinges. Butt to butt, back to, back to hinges, however you wanna call it out. This door would be a left -handed. And if it went this way? Always call out left, right, in, or out. If you're following that procedure and you're doing it that way, you will be right every single time, no matter whose door it is. Okay? Always. What if it's a French door? Like this one. Same thing? Yep. You always use the most operable side first, but then you also have to call that out. So there's another phrase there, right? Active, passive, passive, active, whichever way you want to do it, right? But you have to call out, again, no different than left, right, in, out. Left, right, in, out is still relevant here, but then you have to call out which one's active, which one's passive. My recommendation on a French door, you follow the same logic that we just did over here, but you also draw out a picture and make sure you're marking which one's active and passive and which way your picture is, is viewed from the outside or the inside. Outside of home, inside of home. The only reason why I say that is because people do tend to get confused when it comes to French doors, okay? But make sure you're calling out all three phrases when you're talking about a French both doors operate. Not a patio, patio is different. Patio door is single operating door, okay? Make sense? Is there anything else we need? Sales folks, if, if you wanna be a rock star and you really wanna make yourself stand out in the crowd, especially with all the different types of salespeople that are out there, it wouldn't be a bad idea for you guys to go ahead. You don't need these dimensions. Anybody else just, I mean, don't worry about it. But if you open the door and you start measuring from the top of the door to the top of each hinge and write it down on that page somewhere, do the same thing for the handle sets, do the same thing for the latch, guess what? That customer now thinks that you're a superstar 
because you're paying attention. It doesn't matter because it's all coming out, but it's the perception, right? The more measurements you take, because I guarantee you the next person that walks in that door isn't gonna do it, right? So it makes you more impactful, okay? There's one column that I want you to really, really pay attention to. We always put this stuff in a lot of our literature and a lot of our brochures, and that is the dimensional data, right? The dimensional data is extremely important, and I know it can get really cumbersome because, let's face it, we have 300 pages of doors. We have four different sizing profiles within Thermatrue, and we make it very challenging for you guys. So we try to make this form a lot easier. There's one column that you want to pay attention to, and that is what's called the actual unit size column. I think it's the fourth column over from left to right. It should say actual unit size or actual unit dimension. That is the column that you want to live in because that is the column that you're going to come up with off your measurements from the front side, that's where you should be. If you're not, it tells you one of two things. Either one, you mismeasured, or two, it's a custom door, okay? And what I mean by custom, it's not standard, <laughs> right? Something special has to be done to that, but that's where fabrication really excels, right? So that is the column that you wanna pay attention to. Good? Okay. All right, so let's start talking about install of the unit and where I want you guys to, to, to first focus. So we're out at the job site, right? The sales guy did a great job, sold him this $8,000 door. It's pre-finished, looks great. We're out there to install that unit. What is the first thing that we need to start thinking about as an install team to make sure that we're gonna do the job right? And like, like Chris was saying earlier, you are the most important part to that equation because let's face it, you spend the most amount of time with them and what else are you doing? You're tearing into one of the largest investments of that customer's life, more than likely, right? So what do they do in an R&R application that they don't do in new construction? They watch you like a hawk. Every little move you make, they're watching. And they're gonna criticize you every step of the way because let's face it, they're used to that used car mentality and they think you're there to cheat them. And they just spent $8,000 on a door when they initially went into the thought process that this was gonna be $250, right? So there, there's, there's this whole mentality around that and I don't blame them, right? So this is where I, I use that to my advantage. I start to use it against them, okay? Because I wanna to prove to them that I really do care and I'm here to do the right job and I'm gonna do it right the first time, right? So the very first thing that we wanna do is we want, to un we want to take the door out of the truck, trailer, whatever, however we got it there. We want to unpackage the door. The very first thing that we want to do before we engage the homeowner is to inspect that door unit, right? If it's pre-finished, we want to make sure there's no damage, no scratches. We want to make sure that according to the order form, it's the right model number, the right door, the right glass, the right color, the right handing, the right size. So we're going to use, utilize that sheet again, and we're going to measure the existing door utilizing the form and we're gonna measure the new door that's outside of the opening, because guess what, since this one's out, we can measure across this one, right? Because it's out, I can see it. We're gonna measure it all. We're gonna make sure it's going to fit. Because the last thing we wanna do is rip out that old door, try and put the new door in, and oh, it hits the header. We wanna cut headers? No. no. Sales guys are sales guys. They, they're gonna make mistakes from time to time, right? But that's, they're only human. Okay, so we wanna make sure before we go ripping into things. Last thing I want you ever to do is drywall, or drywall, is to plywood up somebody's home. I had a lot of installers do that when, in my eight years at, at that in-home company. They just, they weren't paying attention, right? They just, they're trying to get it done fast, quick, an hour, no, <laughs> right? So let's not do that, okay? So that's step one, damage. Damage control, product control, making sure that everything is there and what it's supposed to be. Okay, if it is a pre-finished door, what should we be doing then before we start touching anything? Engage the homeowner. What do we know about paints and stains? Especially paint. God loves Sherman Williams with their umpteen million different colors. What do we do? Go get Mr. and Mrs. Jones. Bring them out to the door because guess what? How many box store folks do we have in here today? In your paint departments, what do they do with lighting? They have different types of bulbs, LED, fluorescent, 
standard, soft light, white light, blah, 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 on and on and on. Why are they doing that? Because it massively changes the color. Massively, right? So we don't know what, what the sales folks or the sales team were showing them colors in what lighting, right? How are we to tell <laughs> if it's exactly what they were looking for or not? So the easiest and best way to do it is to do it now. The door's out, it's outside, which is what they're gonna see when that door's installed, right? Mr. and Mrs. Jones, is this the right color? Is this what you chose? I hate doing that in a, in a way because it gives them the opportunity to back out, but I'd rather do it now than after I've already got installed or mostly installed. And they're like, wait, that's not the right color. Because what does that cause? Well, now you're mad at us. <laughs> Darn thermature, don't know what they're doing, right? And it has really nothing to do with us. It's just their expectation was broken, right? So let's do it now. If they agree to it, great, now we can move on. If they don't, we can stop it, we can do, go to the next step, whatever that may be, whatever that has to be, okay? Check with color. Check with handing. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, is this the right way you want this door to swing? You might have to set it up like it's in their house, right? So they can fully visualize which way it's gonna go, right? So you're setting it up on your truck or whatever. Now you're walking up to your home. This is the way it's, yes, that's what I want. Or no, no, no. I told him I wanted to change that, right? It's just making sure. Don't do what I actually saw pictures of. We actually had an installer. I'm not gonna say who, what, where, when, why, but the handing was wrong, so guess what they did? They put the door in upside down. <laughs> Thermature Corporate got the call, and they got the call because the door was leaking. Well, of course it's leaking. <laughs> Could you imagine this door being in upside down? But I can't. They didn't say anything about the aluminum or the silver threshold being on top. <laughs> it's just leaking, right? But. That's what I'm getting at. Don't, don't try that. I mean, it's, it's not worth it. It's going to just create a bunch of headaches, right? So it's a great place to start. Not only that, no different than measuring from the top of the door to the hinges, the strike plates, to all this stuff that you really don't need. You really don't have to do that. But guess what it does? It builds credibility and value to your business. Because what is the absolute cheapest way to make more money? Yeah. What is the easiest way for you to get another sale? What's that? Doing a good job. Doing a good job. How do you do that? Word of, mouth. Word of mouth. Referrals, right? Lead cost generation can get extremely expensive. Lead cost, everybody knows what I mean by that, right? What it costs the company to actually generate that call or to generate that pull or to get that business to be able to even start the process of trying to sell them something can get extremely expensive. I've seen it as low as 100 bucks, but they really don't do any, any advertising, but as high as $1,200 per lead, right? Because of the amount of advertising they do. Guess what a referral costs you? Nothing. Nothing, or very little. You're driving out there or whatever the case may be. Referrals are the absolute cheapest way that you can gain more business and make more money, right? I had somebody yesterday tell me, well, referrals, you know, they, they we usually give kickbacks, so they cost us 100 bucks or whatever. Well, great. It's 100 bucks, not 1,200, right? So this is where that experience starts to really build, and that really starts to help us sell more. Because the fortunate thing about doing a good job is that they're going to tell some people that you did a good job. What's the unfortunate thing if you do a bad job? Everyone. They tell everyone, right? So it takes a lot of great jobs to make an impact, it takes one bad job to make a giant impact, right? So we want to start that conversation, we want to start building that rapport instantaneously. It's extremely important. I'm, I promise you guys, if you start doing this, your customer profile is going to massively increase. It will take some time, because like we just said, right, you do a great job, they might tell one or two of their friends, right? But then you keep doing it, and it starts to really build. You do a bad job, and you act like you don't care it hurts. Your lead generation costs go way up. Okay, it gets much more expensive. All right, so that's step one. Once we're through that, the customer is extremely happy with, with what is out there on the job site. Everything is correct. That's when we start to move to the actual door that's in there. Now, in terms of removal, this is another area where a lot of installers get messy. How do we remove a door that's existing? Do we just start ripping it apart? That's what, we, that's what happens. 
right? People just start ripping into it. They don't care. It's coming out. It's going in the trash. I don't care, right? We need to care. Why? It's their investment. It's their home. You're putting dust everywhere, debris, all this stuff. You're, you're breaking flowers. I can't tell you how many times I had to deal with that. <laughs> the easiest, most efficient way to do it is to start inside. Remove your casing, take a Sawzall and cut your fasteners, whatever may be inside there, cut all that out. Fortunately and unfortunately, expanding foam or spray foam has become pretty popular. Um, a Sawzall does a pretty good job of cutting through that too. Yes, you have more stuff to clean out of the pocket once the door is out, but it, it makes the least mess of all. What else does that do for us though? God forbid something happens and maybe you forgot to measure the new door and it doesn't fit. You can put the old door back in. No more plywood. You can throw the old door back in if you had to because you didn't destroy it taking it out. Make sense? I want to always protect you from having a big, 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 big issue as you move or transition through the steps, okay? Because if you destroy that door, your only option is either go buy one off the shelf and hope that you can get it in or plywood, right? Plywood's cheaper. <laughs> Just doesn't look good, all right? All right, so we cut the old unit out. We clean up our mess. That's the other thing I always suggest to, to, to installers. Clean as you go. Don't just do it at the end. Clean as you go. Again, experience, right? Customers aren't doing this every day. If they experience that good, good job or that good level of service throughout the whole thing, it, it just builds and builds and builds. Because what are they doing? They're watching right over your shoulder. Okay. Old units out. We clean up. Where do we go next? What is the very next thing that we need to start looking at? Because what is the most important thing about an entry door? besides its size and fitting. Let me ask it this way. Those that are selling windows, how are windows installed in an opening? New construction or replacement, doesn't matter. How is a window installed in an opening? It's centered, right? There's a gap all the way around it. The window is floating, effectively, or essentially. Can you do that with a door? No, you better not. <laughs> Why? What's the difference between a window and a door? This is really the only difference between the two. What is the difference? You walk through a door where you don't windows, right? So what do you do? Even though our engineers would tell you you don't do this, you step on this threshold, right? As you walk through. So if you're floating, what happens? It sinks or you break it. Eventually, it will break away from the legs if it's floating, right? They will separate. There's no stopping it, okay? So that means, effectively, that that door is 100% relying on the sill plate of the house, right? 100% relying on it. That better be in perfect condition. Because if it's not, if it's rotten, it's going to create the same effect, right? Eventually, the rot's going to take over. You're going to have a pocket or a hole. And then when you step on that sill, what's going to happen? It's going to break, it's going to fall apart, it's going to sink, it's going to do all these funky things, right? You're going to get that callback or that service. We don't like services. We want to avoid those as much as possible, right? So the sill plate of the house is extremely, extremely important. That is the very first thing. Once that old unit's out, that is where we go. That is where we spend our time. If you spend your time on the sill plate of the house, the rest of the install goes extremely easy. Promise you. Yes, it may take you two hours, three hours, four hours. I don't know what's going on here yet, right? I don't know if it's completely rotten and it's all the way rotten, all the way down to the cinder block foundation or whatever, poured found, whatever, right? I don't, we don't know that until we pulled the unit, but whatever's happening down here, this is where we spend our time, okay? I wanna make that crystal, crystal clear because this is extremely important. So, let's start here. The sill plate is not rotten, but it's out of level. Can we fix it? Do we fix it? How do we fix it if we do fix it? <coughs> you have to fix it. You have to fix it. Now, how do we fix it? Seal support. Hmm? Seal support. So I, I, I found out yesterday that, that concrete pads are extremely <laughs> prevalent here, right? So we're, we're on concrete. So you can use a self-leveling concrete if you wanted right? 
What is the issue with self-leveling concrete during an install? It's got to dry, right? So now you, you've just blown your, your install time way out of the water because you can't just wait an hour because if it's wet at all or soft at all and you set that heavy door on top of it, either one of those, what's going to happen? It's going to sink. It's going to crack it. It's going to do all these funky things to the, the leveling concrete, right? More than likely, it's no longer going to be level either. So we have to pay attention to that. So if you're going to do that, that's okay, but you have to understand that you have to let that dry to the point where it's not going to fail, okay? If it's not concrete, or even if it is concrete, is there any other way that we can actually physically level that off? We can shim it, sort of, kind of. Grind the concrete down. You can do that, which part of our installation instructions does call out a die grinder or a diamond bit side grinder to be able to do stuff like that. Um, so you can do that. It's a little more difficult. People don't tend, and it makes a lot of dust. <laughs> but um, here's where I want to start with leveling. So installers that are in the room, do we own six-foot levels? Yes. Yes. It's a great response out here. I love, I'm gonna come out here more often. Good Lord. Um, I go to the East Coast, nobody, nobody over there owns a six foot level. And it makes me cringe. Um, is there a difference between a six foot level and a two foot level? Besides the obvious, one's two foot, one's six foot. Can you do the same thing with them? No, you, you need that six footer to cover that ground. Cause you cover more, more area. Why is that important? So here, here's what I like to do. You guys have probably been looking at this and wondering why I have these little pieces of paper up here. But I got two sheets of paper, right? One of which is a six foot level, the other is a, a two foot level. And you see dimensions on here of three eighths and an inch and an eighth, right? What am I trying to represent or show you here? Any idea? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you, th this is the easiest way I, I, I've found to explain it to people. If Thermatrue gets called out to a job site because a door slab is warped or it's hitting or it's anything but leaking, what do you think the very first thing we're going to do is? We're going to take a six foot level and we're going to start putting it on the door slab to check if it's warped, right? Warpage on our door slab is very rare. I'm not going to say it's impossible. It's very rare anymore, right? Our door slabs don't just bend, right? Then I'm going to, I'm going to check the frame and make sure it's plumb level and square. But the key there is I'm gonna use a six foot level. Why would I use a six foot level? Because the response that I get all the time, the door is perfect, it's perfectly level. I get out there, I get my six foot level on there, the bubble's touching one of the lines. Is it level? Yeah. No. So you're gonna laugh, but when is a level level? Seems elementary, right? But when is a level level? The bubble has to be dead center in between the two lines. If it's not, what does that mean? Not it's not level, right? So that's my representation here. So here's a two foot level. The center line that you see in the center is a perfectly plumb line. It's perfectly level. Guess what your outer two lines are? The bubble is just touching the line on both the left and the right. Not at the same time, <laughs> right? I move it from one side to the other, <laughs> right? So on a two foot level, it's a 3 8 inch gap between the outer two most lines, okay? This is two foot. Doing the exact same thing on a six foot level, see the difference? I'm now at an inch and an eighth. Exact same thing, the bubble's just touching the line. So why do we use a six foot level? Because on a two foot level, if it's touching the line, it's only three eighths of an inch. But on a six foot level, if it's touching the line, it's an inch and an eighth. So is that door out of square? Out of plumb? Out of level? Mm -hmm. Yes, massively at that point, right? But it didn't show up so bad here because it's only two foot. But it shows up massively here because you're covering a bigger gap, like you said, right? Always, always, always use the largest level you possibly can. So on a 36-inch opening, what are you going to put in there if you're leveling off the sill? A two-foot level, right? They don't have a three-foot level. You can get two, four, six eight and expandables, right? Two foot level, it's the biggest one you can fit in there. But if you've got a big six foot wide opening, we should be using six foot. a six foot level. 
right? If it's six foot wide, we better be able to get a six foot level in there because it better be over six foot. It better be. Or we're not ordering a six foot door to put in there. <laughs> okay. So a level is only level when the bubbles are completely in between the two lines. They cannot touch. They cannot vary. They cannot go either way. No exceptions. Okay. I know it seems elementary, but I'm telling you right now, this is what we see all day, every day. So back to leveling off the sill. If this sill is out of level, if the sill plate of the house is out of level, the first thing that I want you to consider is can we put a solid shim underneath that door? What do I mean by solid shim? Solid piece of wood, a piece of plywood. Doesn't have to be a half inch, quarter inch. I mean, it could be whatever, right? But how do we determine whether or not we can even do that? Where do we need to go? What do we need to do? Well, we need to measure our height of our rough opening. How much room do we have from the top of that door, the new door, to the header of the wall? Do we have a half inch, three quarters of an inch, an inch and a half, two inches, five inches? What do we have to the header? Okay, because that's gonna determine whether or not we can use a piece of plywood. Because if it's only a quarter inch from the top of the door to the header, can we put a piece of quarter inch plywood in there? No. Okay, because it's gonna be tight. We don't want tight, All right? But if there's an inch, sure. We can get a quarter inch piece of plywood in there. We have plenty of room, because we still have three quarters after that, All right? Now, just putting a piece of plywood down in here doesn't really help, does it? It's still out of level because now it's just following the sill plate. So what do we do? How do we level that off? Shim it. Shim it. How do we shim it? Again, another elementary question, right? Again, I ask this question because of what we see. <laughs> we solid shim underneath the piece. So if, if I was to pretend that this was the piece that I put in, I'm gonna solid shim underneath it, side by side by side by side, from my max all the way to nothing. Follow what I'm saying? Is it acceptable to do this? To gap it, to space it, underneath the plywood? No, why? It could create a wave, right? depending on what's, what thickness of plywood you put down there, if it's only a quarter inch thick, what do we know about quarter inch thick plywood? It flexes quite a bit, right? And if you put a big enough gap, what could happen? It could break. And now we have a big issue because what, what's relying on that sill? The whole sill of our door. We don't want it to sink anywhere, okay? Always, always, always solid. What if we have a scenario where you only have a half inch to the header and you can't use a piece of plywood, but you have to level it, what do we do then? <clears throat> Shim the door? My rule of thumb, guys, is we never ever should be shimming directly underneath the door in this fashion. I'm gonna have to do it on this one because those are all in. Um, sorry, guys. This is what we see a lot. One single shim or a couple shims on underneath one jam leg and maybe one under the other. If it's a double door or a French door or that one there, a lot of times we'll see this where they'll shim here and here because that side is dropped and they're trying to raise it, but they're doing that. Remember what I said about solid shimming? Can we do that? No, because we're creating a weak point. The sill can sink, right? If you don't have room to put plywood underneath that door to create a new solid base, guess what? You're gonna have to create a solid base out of shims. No different than what we did underneath the sheet of plywood, do a solid bank of shims all the way across from max to nothing, right? Keeping it completely perfectly level. Do not stop, do not space them, do not just shim underneath the actual jam legs. It creates a problem. Now you're making that door float. We don't want it to float. Make sense? A lot of installers at this point down there, they will always use composite shims. Why? Well, we know water ends up down there, right? So composite shims are probably the greatest thing to use down there. They will still compress, 
no different than wood, right? Um, but they are extremely expensive in comparison to these standard shims. Um, so they will only use them down there, and then once they make it to the actual door shimming, they'll use standard shims on the sides, okay? Up to you on which way you want to do it, but my, my big, big thing is making sure it's solid. Back to back, side to side, however you want to word that, right? Keep it solid all the way across. And as we're speaking on shims, I need more so better representation. Is this acceptable? Can you shim like this? Why? Because they move? What's that going to do to the sill if I did that? Or what's that going to do to the side of the door if I did that? I'm not going to twist it, right? And it's really bad if you do it this way from the outside and you're doing that. Because now what have we done to the sill? You know, the sill has a natural angle that goes away from the door. If you shim it that way, you've just made it go the other way. So now where's the water going? <laughs> right to the weakest part of the door, the bottom of the door, right? Where the, where the sweep is. We don't want the water there. We want it away. Get it away, right? So never, ever, ever is there ever an instance where you can stack shims like this. They always have to be alternating every single time, completely level with each other. Okay? Always. Archer's recommendation is to always use a silk pan of some nature, and the reason for that is because we know water will end up down there. Even if it's not the door, and there's a window above the door, or there's a hole in a wall somewhere, water always follows the path of least resistance, right? Always. If there's water inside of this wall cavity somewhere, especially when you're dealing with a bigger door, a French door, or a door with two side lights like that, water will almost always find its way to that opening. Why? Because, well, it's the biggest opening in the wall. More than likely, everything is settled down to it, so that's where it's going to run path of least resistance, it's going to come out the door. It may not be the door that's leaking, but it's coming out there, right? So the sill pan will help deter or channel that water out of the home, not into the home, right? Even if it's not the door that's leaking, I still want to get it away. So we always recommend a sill pan of some nature. Watch out for aluminum. If you use PVC, PVC is fine, right? PVC has a, has a great reaction rate with everything. Um, the only, the only issue with PVC is if it's not a pre-molded or pre-casted um, pan, you're, gonna, you're still going to have issues with the corners. Yeah, the stuff that out here in the West that we use, and you know what you're talking about, but if you're not an installer that carries a break, you don't do aluminum wraps. Aluminum wraps. Like yeah. I know because our company does all over the country, because I know back east, our installers carry all that. Oh, yeah. Trucks. It's huge in the east. Out, out here, it's talked about wrapping a break. Yeah. <laughs> like you're nuts. <laughs> yeah, That's why well, yesterday, or whatever for if it's required, we try to add that once on to as an add-on, but it's never sold. I mean, never sold, ever. Um, yesterday, there was actually a, a few folks that were actually talking about them. There's a couple of them that were actually using them. Um, which surprised me because my understanding was the same thing that you just said that it's just not used out here. Uh, I've also seen other guys that they, they actually have fabricated um, stainless steel pans. And I don't know how they determine that without removing the unit and what size they need, but apparently they only pay like 30 bucks for them, which is really cheap. <laughs> Especially if they're pre molded corners and all that great stuff. But anyway. <clears throat> um, a couple other options that can be used if a silk pan is needed or wanted. Um, you can use. You already heard me say it once, but we call it ice and dam shield in the east, and the reason why is because, well, we have to deal with a lot of ice, where you don't have to deal with that so much here, but this flex wrap or, or a rubberized membrane. Um, the great thing about this stuff, they, they use this for flashing on windows, they use this for all kinds of different things. The great thing about this is you can nail through this all you want, and it reseals, it's self-sealing. Um, you can damage it and it self-seals, right? So that's extremely important with this stuff. Um, you can mold corners out of this, you can, you can protect that substrate or that sill plate with this um, because one thing that we know about water is when it hits an edge, it does what? It curls back. It rolls backwards. It'll hit the edge, come down, and roll backwards. So if you have a lip and there's a gap underneath that lip and if water's coming down, it's going to come in. It's just the nature of the beast. 
So the great thing about doing some kind of a silt pan is you can wrap down and over that edge and make sure that that water continues to go down and not back into the house. Make sense? This stuff is very, very good for that. The only issue or downside with this, and you already alluded to it earlier, is you can't do a back bend on the inside where the sill actually sets up against it. So if water's there, the water still has the potential to roll either in or out. It's its choice, path of least resistance, right? Whichever way is easier. So that's the only downside to doing something like this, but it does protect your corners. It does protect your silt plate of the house. So it stops rot, all that good stuff, okay? There's one other one that I wanna to quickly touch on. And that is this one here, which is probably very similar to what you're used to seeing. This is a Thermature silt pan. Um, Thermature manufactures our own silt pan. It is adjustable. As you can see here, it comes with everything that you need to actually physically install this. And really the only tool that you need is these two here. It comes with the adhesion or the glue and a little brush. Um, because when you put this glue on here, we don't want you to just glob it on and try and push them together. Because we don't want to rise in the sill. No different than what I was talking earlier, it will affect the sill of the door. If there's a bump, so you got to brush it out, make it level, squeeze the two together, hold it for 30 seconds, and it's sealed. Okay. Um, the greatest benefit to this pan is this: these end corner pieces. It is a molded corner, so when this goes on, just imagine that we're down at the bottom. It completely seals up the corner of the door, so it's a molded corner, and it goes on both sides, right? And then there would be a centerpiece to make up the difference with these two. Okay. A couple little bit of downsides to these. Um, we only have two different sizes. We have a 4 and 9 sixteenths depth and a 6 and 9 sixteenths depth, which is your most common until you get into the, the older homes where you have a lot of five and a quarter because of the lath and plaster and all that great stuff, right? Um, so we only have the two different widths or the two different depths. And then we only have two different lengths. We have a 36 inch pan, which is what this one is. And we have a six foot pan, okay? The great thing about the six foot pan, if you're over six foot, you just get another one and you use the center out of it and you just keep going. You keep building it out and out and out, okay? Because you really only need the two corners and then fill the center. Um, if you are outside of the range, say it's Say it's a five and a quarter, since you guys do run into a lot of five and a quarters. You would order a six and nine. You would cut off the outside lip. You would set this back inside the opening to where the door's gonna stop. And then you use the flex rack to take up the difference. Make sense? Or you'd use the four and nine sixteenths to make the same thing. Cut off the lip, you make up the difference with the flex rack. Make sense? Uh, if, you, if you are going to use some kind of a sill pan, the other thing that I always recommend folks to do, um, if you want to be a really, really good installer, once you put this into the opening, you also take the flex wrap and you mold around the corner. If you, again, if you want to be really good with it, you go all the way to the header with the flex wrap. That way, any water that's coming down that wall from anywhere else, it's going to hit that wrap. It has no choice but to go into the pan at that point, because if you just do this and you don't have it real tight, it can hit the seam and drop down and go underneath the pan, which we don't want, right? So if you go all the way up with that flex wrap, it has no choice but to hit the pan and go out. No choice at all, okay? Um, that, that's just to go above and beyond. We don't call that out. We don't write that into the instructions. It's just an extra step. Again, trying to, trying to create that great experience with the homeowner. Um, the other question I always get on these is, what about a concrete substrate where it's level? or it's a pad, because we have a down bend on our sills, which you can see, this goes in, and it's supposed to drop down and around the sill plate. What if it's on concrete? Well, you can't do that, right? Flip it over, take a razor blade, cut off that bottom lip, snap it off. The only um, thing that I always tell people to do at that point is make sure you're running a bead of caulking on the underside because of that lip. Remember when water hits an edge, it wants to roll back and under, so we want to stop that from happening. So if you do remove this lip for any reason, make sure you're sealing the underside of it so that water doesn't want to travel back. Make sense? Pretty easy, pretty straightforward. Um, these are not expensive. They're really cheap. Um, and I, I really, really like them. It, it saves a lot of headache. 
down the road. Any questions on silt pads? Am I boring you? Good. All right. So, sill plates level. We fixed all the damage. We talked through the sill pans. What do we need to pay attention to next? What is next in the equation before we start bringing the door over to the unit? Yesterday, I got a response. Well, we want to dry fit the unit after we've, we've set the or fixed the sill plate. I'm actually okay, okay with you doing that. I, I'm not. I'm not a big advocate of dry fit and things. I'm going to tell you why. If that is a pre-finished door, what is the last thing you want to do? Damage it. So the more you move that unit, the more chances you have of damaging it, right? So the least amount of handling, the better. So let's just leave it alone, and let's just focus on what, what's important in the moment, okay? So the next place we want to go after we fix the sill is checking the opening for squareness, and plumbness. Is it going to stop us from installing that unit? Either one of them? No. So what, why do I need it? Why do I care? I didn't know if I have to offset. So great. So great transition. So we're going we're to talk about squareness first. How do we know or how do we check if a door is square? Or if the, I'm sorry, the opening is square. You can string test it. It's the absolute best way to do it. The only issue with the string test is if they've got some nice ornate trim around that door, where are you going to put your nails or your tacks or your whatever, right? You can't. You don't want to go ruining their product or what's already there. It makes more work for you. It's a great way to do it, but you can't always do it, right? And everybody know what a string test is? String test, you put a tack in all four corners. Take a piece of string, you go from corner to corner, corner to corner. If they touch in the center, just touch. It's plumb. If they're away from each other, it's out of plumb. Or if they're like going into each other massively, it's out of plumb. And then you rotate. So if you're this way to this way, you rotate and you switch the strings and you overlap them the other direction. So you can check both planes. Follow what I'm saying? The easiest way, the best way, the safest way is a framing square not a speed square. Everybody know what a speed square is, right? It's just a little tiny thing. Speed squares are not designed to check for squareness and framing. Hence, framing square. Framing squares are not the cheapest things in the world, and if you drop them, you can damage them. Um, but fortunately, they can be recalibrated. But framing square is where you want to go. Do we want to check squareness down here? At the bottom? Don't have to. I'm going to tell you why. We just spent all that time fixing the sill. It's perfectly level. I really don't care where these are at the bottom. I do care where they are up here. If this is on a square up here, no different than what you said, it's going to tell me where I need to position that door inside of this opening. Because if this, if this is way out, do I want to push this door this way? No, because what's it going to do to the door? It's going to throw the door out, right? No matter what I try and do the rest of the installation, that is going to play havoc on my install, okay? So that, that means I want to cheat the door this way to get away from this. Because let's face it, there's nothing I can do about that wall being out of, out of square, is there? We're not in the business of tearing into their wall and replacing jack studs, right? I hope not. <laughs> Some folks are, but... It's very, very, very expensive, very time consuming. So I just want to check uh, squareness of the top two corners and see where that, what that tells me. It only tells me where I need to position that, that product or that door, okay? Is there anything else? Plumbness. We talked about plumbness with the, with the string test. This again is where that six foot level really, 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 really helps us. So we can check plumbness of the actual wall. So we go to the outside, we check the plumbness of that wall. What is this going to tell us? Or what is this going to do for us? Help with the swing. Help with the swing? Both don't. Help with the way that the door itself, yeah. if it opens by itself. Right. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, it does do that. Well, Anything else? If it's leaning one way or the other, it's still got to be straight up and down. So Thank you. How far are you going to set it in? And or what are you going to do to make that door still plumb, square, and level? Right? Here's the other opportunity that it provides you. No different than we did earlier with bringing the customer out to the door, check color, handing style, all that great stuff. Guess what? Do you think a customer is going to know if their wall's out of plumb or not before you get there? No. Guess what happens if you install that door and you've got all these shims everywhere and you're not coil cladding that door and you can't really hide it all and they see that, what are they going to think? You did a crappy job. You're cheating them. I'm, I'm, being, I'm being honest, right? They don't know what they don't know. So it's our job to train them, to teach them. And the best place to do that, guys, is after that old door is out, before we've even brought that new door over, we fix the sill. And by the way, we've already talked to them about that. If there's rot there, of course, you're bringing them over because there's an extra charge for that. I just kind of assumed we all guessed that. But at that point, you also start talking about the plumbness. Mr. and Mrs. Jones, your wall is a half inch out of plumb. What's that? I don't know what plumb is. You explain it. Plumbness is, is the angle of your wall, whether it's in, out, whatever the case may be, right? But you don't stop there. I've had a lot of installers, they started to do this, and they test it for this. They bring the customer over. Mr. And Mrs. Jones, your, your wall's a half inch out of plumb. I'm going to keep going. What does that do? Makes them mad. What? So? What the, what's that mean? And they still didn't walk them through it or teach them or make them understand or help them understand what that actually means for the install. Because what that means for the install is exactly what you were just saying. We're going to have to cheat that unit in, out, we're gonna to have to cheat it somewhere and we're gonna to have to cut a shim and fill the gap, right? We have no choice because if we don't hang that door plumb, it's gonna do exactly what you said and it's gonna rub or it's gonna open and close by itself or it's gonna hit something, right? The functionality of the door massively relies on plumbness and squareness and the sill, right? So if this wall is out of plumb, we need them to understand what it is not only that the wall's out of plumb, but what it is that we're going to do to rectify that situation. Don't ever just tell them and stop. Tell them and give them a solution. This is what I'm going to do to correct it. And then stop. They may have more questions about it. That's great. It's a great opportunity to help coach them. Because guess what? The other guys aren't going to do it. Most installers will just go out there and just do it. Because again, it's quick. They get paid by the job typically. right? Not by the hour. So they're there, they're there to blow through it. Take the time, build the value, get the referral, okay? Plumbness is extremely important because you're gonna to have to trim the outside, you're gonna to have to trim the inside to fix it, okay? Is there anything else we need to know before we start actually working with the new door? Plumbness, squareness, levelness. We spend our time at the sill, we check for squareness, we check for plumbness, we know where we have to position the door, we know if we have to go in or out with this unit, we're ready to start installing the new product. So, what is the first step in installing the new door? We started talking about it earlier and that was caulking, right? We have to seal that unit in. Fortunately and unfortunately, the door itself is, I mean, it's designed to seal itself, right? but that's within the weather stripping. Everything outside of the weather stripping, we're relying on what? Yeah, the installer to caulk it in, seal it in, coil it in, whatever. It has to be sealed to that home somehow, some way, right? So the first place I like to start to talk about is the sill itself or underneath the sill, okay? That is probably the first place that water will ever come in. Why? Well, all the water goes there. Okay, so thinking of a, a single 36 inch door, <coughs> I'm going to try and make you guys laugh a little bit, but I'm, I'm being serious. On a single 36 inch door, per Thermature's actual black and white written instructions, anybody read it by the way? <laughs> How many tubes of caulk do we require? for a 36 inch door without anything else. If you're just using caulking to seal that unit to the house, how many tubes of caulk do, you, do we require? 
Six. Six. Single, 36 inch door, six to the call. <laughs> yes, it is six tubes though. All, all serious, all seriousness aside, it is six tubes. We require at least a full, at least a full tube underneath the door alone. One of the first tests that we're going to perform, if, if we have a leaking unit, one of the first tests that we're going to perform is a hacksaw blade. If we can stick a hacksaw blade underneath that sill halfway, you fail. It's going to leak. Make sense? Follow what I'm saying? If I can get a hacksaw blade halfway up that sill, where do you think water's going? And once it makes it to halfway, well, now it's a 50 50 shot. Is it going to go out? Is it going to come in? Let's face it, it always goes in. Always. For whatever reason. Right? Water just likes to mess with us. So we need that entire tube, at least an entire tube underneath it, if you want to be above and beyond a tube and a half. Okay? Speaking of caulking, what kind of caulking can we use? Polyurethane. Polyurethane. Anything else? <laughs> Do not ever, ever, ever use silicone or silicone infused product. There are so much, so many different manufacturers, there are so many different types of caulking that are all silicone or silicone infused today. Why? What is the benefit of silicone? It's easy to work with, right? It's malleable, it's flexible, it's easy to tool. Because for whatever reason, everybody always has to finger the caulking. <laughs> Right? <laughs> Silicone is easily manipulated. <laughs> Polyurethane is not. It's sticky. As soon as you touch it, what happens? <laughs> it goes everywhere. It sticks to everything. You, you, you can't. It's, it's not easy to tool at all. So that means what? You better be really good with a caulk gun. And you better not have any air bubbles in it. Right? Because you're running your nice, beautiful bead. You're doing a great job. You make it two-thirds of the way through and pop. <laughs> right? Now you can't tool it, now you got a big hole. Right? So what do you do? So polyurethane style caulking or last merit style caulking is the only thing that you're allowed to use on any of our product. Does anybody know why? Why would we call those out? Does silicone not stick to anything? Or does silicone stick to everything? You stick to something. <laughs> mm, silicon action. It doesn't do too bad with metal. What it doesn't stick to is composite. Guess what's on the underside of our sill? Guess what else it doesn't stick to? House wrap. <laughs> so if the house has house wrap on it, and it has a Deposit threshold on the underside, and you use silicone, it's a waste. You just wasted your time, you just wasted your money, and guess what? You're going to have a service call. Again, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. The greatest thing about silicone, or the test that I usually do for that, right, um, if I have enough time, is I'll take a piece of deposit, put a bead of silicone on it, I'll even try and tool it out, and I'll let it dry. And you can actually grab it. It comes off perfectly clean. <laughs> it's absolutely amazing. It will not stick to composites. It will not stick to house wrap. Can you use liquid nail? No. <laughs> liquid nail, because it's non-flexible at all, as it shifts, everything moves, right? It'll crack. And then now you get a leak. Okay? You have to have some flexibility, which is why a lot of folks always go to silicone, because it is the most flexible of all the products out there. But if it doesn't stick, who cares? It's flexible. Now it's really flexible because it's not sticking to anything. <laughs> right? So, last merit or polyurethane base style caulking, nothing else. Okay. Um, PL Pre P L Premium is one of the leading manufacturers in both of those styles. Y'all carry that stuff in, in all types of different configurations and styles, colors. 
Um, and that stuff works really, really well. Okay. So, tube, tube and a half caulking underneath the door. The patterns that I like to run, I guess I should have just kept that. The patterns that I like to run is this. So on the door itself, I lay the door down flat on its face, not on its inside, but on the outside face. Why? Because that way the door is actually resting against the weather stripping and not pulling on my hinges or pulling on my multi-point or whatever may be in there, right? I want it to rest where, where it should be. So I lay the door down flat on its face, and the first place that I put my beta caulk is the outside perimeter of the sill. I do basically a rectangle around it, right? Am I done? No. Then I do a zigzag pattern through the center. Am I done? Done with this. I repeat the process here. Same pattern, outside perimeter, same zigzag pattern. If I have them laying close enough to each other, if, if I can, depending on the stoop and porch, yada, 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 I'll try and make sure that I'm off-centered from each one. So when I set them together, they're not on top of each other, each line. They're away from each other. So I get full coverage. Make sense? Never, ever, ever do you ever want to go this way, just straight. And never, ever, ever do you just want to go this way, just straight. Because guess what? If water gets in there, You've either created a channel coming in or out, which, like we said earlier, it's always going to go in. Just make sure the beast. Um, or if you're this way and water does get in there, where's it going to go? It has to go to the corners if it can, or it just sets it there. And if there's no treat, or if there's no treated lumber, or if there's no sill pan, if there's no nothing, what's going to happen to your sill? It's gone. It's going to rot because you're holding it. Okay. The zigzag pattern allows it to move some if it does get in there but it also will seal it off from the outside so nothing can be driven in there. Okay. All right. So look, door's laying down on its face. We've caulked the underside of the sill. We've caulked the sill plate itself. Is there anywhere else that we need to caulk before we actually set the door? If the door comes with brick mold attached, how often do you guys order with brick mold attached? Most part? Half and half. So if the brick mold's attached, you want to caulk the backside of the brick mold as well. Two and a half goes all the way around the unit. So it's a nice, healthy feed of caulking on the backside. I call it back buttering. Somebody asked me yesterday, Were you, did you tile? Yeah, I did that too. But no. I back butter the backside of the brick mold, and I try and go either just center or just outside of center. So closer to the outside perimeter of the brick mold. And the reason why is I want to make sure that I'm going to contact whatever sheeting or, or Tyvek or, or house wrap, whatever may be on there. I want to make sure that I'm contacting that. Okay. If you go towards the corner, what's usually here? You can see it on these doors. There's a gap, right? So if that brick mold's attached and you went right there in the corner, where'd that caulking go? Went into the gap. Not really touching anything. So you want, to, you want to try and stay on that outside perimeter, okay? But at this point, when that door is laying down is when you want to do that. You don't want to try and go from the inside and hold the door out a little bit. I've seen the solar to try and do all kinds of weird things. That's where you want to do it. If the brick bolt's not attached, well, we don't need to worry about that right now because we're just worrying about the frame itself. The brick bolt goes on later. We can back butter that later, okay? So when we're setting the door, what is it that we want to do before we actually lift that door enough into place? When you're setting a door, can you just lift it up and slide it in? This brick mold's attached, you're going to end up with sticky fingers because I'm not all that talking from the back side. But no, you roll it in, right? So the brick mold's attached, you grab a hold of the door, you actually put the bottom over with the top kind of leaning towards the outside. You set the um, brick mold all the way against the sheeting or all the way against the house, and you roll the door into place. Why would we want to do that? Why can't we just set it? It pushes all that, all that caulking that you just put underneath that door. If you just slide it in, where's it all going? All going to the inside of the house, right? You got a big mess to clean up. You're gonna have a big mess to clean up anyway because of how much is going down, right? But you just pushed us all to the inside. So when that door leaks and we come out with a hacksaw blade, 
I'm going to go way past 50%. I'm going to go all the way to the inside profile, right? And then it's going to stop because it's hitting all that talking. But be very careful when you're doing that. Always roll the door up into place, okay? That will compress that caulking very well. It'll come down and, and even, and then it'll start to ooze out both inside and outside. That's when you know you did it right. If you get nothing oozing out on the outside perimeter, you more than likely slid it at some point. It's a little more challenging when it doesn't have brick mold because there's nothing there to hold that door in place, right? which it wouldn't be a bad idea before you actually lay that door down to go ahead and pre-drill your holes for your install screws because as soon as you get that door up, up in this opening, what's gonna happen with all that caulking down there? It's gonna get really slippery, right? It's gonna wanna move on you, okay? So that's why it's always a good idea to have somebody on the inside when you're doing a, a non-attached brick mold door just to keep that from, from sliding in so you can determine exactly where that door needs to go and as soon as you get it up in there, you can start to run a screw in enough to hold it. And then you just move on to the next couple steps, which we're going to talk about here in a second. But does that make sense? Wouldn't be a bad idea to preset those holes if it doesn't have brick mold attached, which is what I did to this unit because there is no brick mold. Okay? When we start to talk about install screws, a couple things I want to cover there is positions. Where do we position the install screws first and foremost? Where is it that they need to go? Inside and at the hinges, right? So, yep, I, I figured when you said hinges and then inside, so I figured that's what you were saying. So yes, always at the hinges. We recommend always going through the fat part of the jam or the inch and a quarter portion that we were talking about earlier with the measuring, right? This is the thickest, most structural sound part of the wood. We want you to go here. Right here's the hinge, right here's the screw. Right here's the hinge, right here's the screw. Right here's the hinge, right? Follow what I'm saying? You always start on the hinge side first and then we move through. Is there ever a case where you can't or shouldn't go here? Sure. Same. What if it's the same frame? A lot of installers do not like to drill through that. Why? Because it's, it's hard to hide that fastener. I don't care what you do, I don't care what kind of putty you're using or what kind of touch up you're using, it never matches, right? We all know that. that that's no secret, it's been that way forever. Minwax does a really good job of making all these great wood fillers that are supposed to be color matched, and they're close, but they're never the same, right? Even to their stains, it's never the same. We just, we know that. For whatever reason, homeowners don't know that. We know that being in the industry. Again, we can explain that. So a lot of times installers don't like to go through here if it's a stained frame especially. Um, if it's painted, they're, they're kind of on the fence because it usually comes with a bottle of touch-up paint, and that's fairly simple to, to fix. Right. So what do you do? Yep. The easiest thing to do is to actually pull the weather stripping out. Everybody knows this comes out real easy, right? It's just a curve with a thin um, band of weather stripping, right? Pull it out. Why do I say to pull it out? I've seen this all the time. People always hit this weather stripping with the head of the screw or with the screw gun, and they tear it, put a hole in it. Now you got a new piece of weather stripping. The customer's mad. $8,000 unit, you just destroyed it, it's just a piece of weather stripping. It's 10 cents. No, well, you destroyed my $8,000 door, right? That's, that's how they view it. So just pull it out. You can put it right back in, it's not gonna hurt anything. Pull it out, hide your screw behind that curve or behind where this weather stripping is going to live. But is there something that we need to make sure that we're doing when we put a screw here? Can we go straight in? Why might you miss? Why might you miss? You're really close to the edge of the jack stud now, which is why Thermo Choice suggests to use this profile, because if you go dead center of this and straight, guess what you're gonna hit? That beautiful stud that's sitting in here, okay? If you're here, you're towards the inside edge of that stud, because now you got all your drywall and all that stuff on the inside, so you're already, you're starting to encroach. So if you're not careful and you go straight where you have a slight angle towards the inside, Where's that screw going to come out? It's going to come out the drywall. Okay, so we have to be extremely careful when we're using this profile. I see it a lot more when people use hinges. They'll take the hinge plate off and they'll try and hide the screw behind the hinge. Well, now you're even closer. You better be angling back towards the outside, otherwise you're going to miss the jack set altogether. Okay, you might just hit drywall. Hopefully it doesn't come out. 
So anytime you're using this profile or if you're using the hinges, make sure you're always angling that screw back towards the outside of the home to hit that jack stick. Make sense? Always, always, always. I would prefer here. I'm okay with here. Just make sure you're angling. Screws. What kind of fasteners can we use? Or should we use? Jerk, 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 jerk. Fasteners, fasteners, fasteners. Can we use drywall screws? I think you no. Never, ever, ever. Drywall screws don't what? They don't take moisture. Oh. They get wet, they rust, they break. Which is why they're inside, not outside, they're not exterior grade, right? Always be using an exterior grade fastener. We have a lot of folks that we use the new deck screws. Um, I'm fine with that. A lot of the deck screws are Torx bits, and they're not Phillips. They have a shanked head to them. Everybody know what I mean by shanked head? The threads do not go all the way up the screw. They have a flat neck, it's called a shank, right? Almost all deck screws anymore have that shank on them, unless they're full composite deck screws, because they have the different thread pattern, right? Always use the shanked head. Always use an exterior grade. Our recommendation is a number eight stainless steel, two and a half to three inches long. Number eight is just the size or the thickness of the screw, okay? I like that because, again, no different than the deck screws. It is a Torx head, not a Phillips. What do we know about the difference between the two? Much harder to strip out a, a Torx bit than it is a Phillips. Much harder. I'm not going to say impossible, but much harder, right? What do we not like about stainless steel, though? They're soft. Stainless steel is a soft metal. Everybody know that? It's very easy to snap the head of a stainless, stainless steel screw off. Very easy. If you're using an impact, you're going to do it every time. But what's the big benefit behind stainless? It will not rust. It will not break. After you're done solving it. Okay? It is an extremely sound fastener. And that's why we recommend that. That's why uh, I recommend that. The shank portion of the screw. Why do you think I, I keep talking about that and calling that out? What do you what would you what benefit would that give me? Is that anything? It gives me flexibility on installation. So if it's a shank screw and I put this screw through that jam leg, just like I did here, that shank portion of that screw sorry, is sitting inside my jam. So what can I do with my jam? I can move it. Okay. If threads are in here, so if, if that was a fully threaded screw and the threads are still left in there, what can't I do? I'm not going to be able to move that. And if I try, what might happen? I might break the jam. I might crack it. Okay. If I crack a jam, I got a new door. See why I'm talking about it? Very important. Shanked head screws, number eight, stainless steel, exterior at least, great fastener. Um, if you do the, the three inch screws, the shank on the screw is actually a lot longer, which gives you more play. Okay, that's why I do the threes. Number eight. Number eight. Number eight. Three inch is what I use. Stainless steel, but as long as it's a Torx fit, I would rather have you have to use a Torx than a Phillips. Yep. So, do we have any questions at all about what we've covered to this point? So we've covered. The measuring form, how to measure, how to tell if something's plumb square or level, how to fix the sill, how to shim the sill, extremely important, right? What does it mean if we're out of square? Where do we need to square off of? Any questions on any of that? Not that this really change, but I just want to make sure that we're all on the same page at this point. Okay. What we're gonna transition next, we're actually gonna install this door unit, um, trying to follow the same rules that, that I basically just reviewed with you. And then as soon as this is in, what I'm gonna have you guys do is actually get up and I'm gonna have you come up to the door because the rest of the stuff that is, is involving this unit, you won't be able to see from where you are.
okay? Um, it is extremely important that you see a lot of this stuff because this is the, besides the sill, these are the things that are always missed or always create that, that confusion. So I want to make sure that we're very crystal clear on the last few steps of the install, okay? Uh, can I get uh, one of you guys to help me? <coughs> I tried to lock the multi-point, but it's not going to work with the flexibility. All right, so setting this door, even though this one doesn't have brick mold on it, you still want to follow the same guidelines. This is what I was talking about earlier, where the top of the door is kind of tilted out towards you, right? Because every single time you want to make sure that you're rolling that door into place and not sliding it across. Usually with a single door, a lot of guys, a lot of installers want to try and manhandle this on their own and do it, but it's not the greatest idea in the world to do um, because you're going to end up sliding it. It's almost inevitable, okay? Just push this back. Don't watch what I'm doing at the moment. I'm just trying to make sure that it doesn't fall out of here. I don't need anybody hurt today. So, as we start to install this door, thank you very much. As we start to install this door, where do we want to focus first? So the door is set into the opening. Where is the first place that we want to start to fasten? The hinge side. Hinge side. Why the hinge side? Because it'll hold the door in place. Because it'll hold the door in place. All the weight of this unit, no matter if it's a single door, a, a French door, a door with side lights, you always, always, always start with the hinge side. So this particular door is pretty easy, right? This is the hinge side of the door. All the weight is being transferred to those three hinges. So we want to we want to secure that weight on this side. Make sense? What if we went to this door? What side of this door is the hinge side? It's a French door, right? You have two hinge sides. But what side do we start with? Pass it. This is your you just pretend that this is a fixed panel. Most of your weight's gonna come off of this. Yes, you have weight here too, but this is the bigger one. Because this sets this, right? Which is your more critical position to have set right, because then you can play around with this side if you had to. But guess what? If you follow what I said in the beginning and you spent that time on the sill plate, if you set here, or if you set there, Inside, are you really gonna have to play much around with this? Maybe plumb this in and out because of the wall, but in terms of levelness and squareness, this side would basically take care of itself. Basically, All right? How about this one? Now, I don't know if you guys noticed, but this is a door with two venting side lights, so this is a triple operating door actually. But what about this door? What side is hinge side on this one? This side, correct, left. Hinge side, yes, there's hinges here, and yes, there's hinges here, but again, no different than the French door. We want to pull all that weight back to the main hinge side. Make sense? Always, always, always start with the hinge side of the unit. No different than what we were talking about before. Your screw positions will always be at the hinges. One, two, three. And then I always start with the bottom or the top of the hinge side. Why not the center? Because I have to be able to adjust the top and bottom. I have to set plumbness off top and bottom, squareness off the top and bottom, the center. It doesn't help me at all, does it? The only thing I want here is structural support once these are set, okay? Real quick, I want to talk about this. So you'll see up here that we have two wood jams, that door and the French door have wood jams on them. This last door has a composite jam on it, right? So is there a difference in installation from that door to this door to this door? Is there a difference? Do you have to do anything differently? I'll give you a hint, there's a reason why there's three doors over here. Yes, it's behind you. Grab that ring. 
Yes, there is a difference from every single one of these. Okay, that's why there's three doors up here. On a standard wood jam, one, two, three, one, two, three, you're done. On this door, with a standard wood jam, but because it's a French door, there is a difference. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two. Why? Why would I put two screws up here and not anything over there? There's no structural support here, is there? Because this moves, right? So what could happen to that header? It can move. What else is here? Strike plates, right? This is where my astrical locks in. And it's also where my multi-point off my main door locks in, right? So what do I want to make sure happens here at this plate? That it's secure. Because it's, we're relying on that to keep this door closed and secure, right? Always, 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 you have to put screws in here. You can use the strike plate screws if you get color matched screws. So you can pull the smaller screws out of the strike plate and use some two and a half or three inch screws to go through that which really will secure this, but make sure that you're putting shims above it because you see what happens if there's no shims. Or I can go this way, right? Make sure you're shimming, okay? What about this one? Is there a difference here? How many of you guys use full composite jams? Answer that question for you. I don't know. Full composite jams. Not wood. Do you use them? Do you buy them? You can work when you order it. Do you? Do. I try. I try to sell Okay. That. Okay. The que I mean, the, the basis of my question is to make sure if, if I'm wasting your time or not. Because full composite jams, there is a massive difference in the way that they're installed than any wood jam. Okay. Full composite jams, because of the nature of what it is. Now, Dark Retreat does not make a composite jam, right? This is not ours, so it's not our written instructions. I'm, I'm basing this off of the information that I read, because yes, I read instructions. The information I read from this manufacturer on how they want their full composite jams installed. Okay, just so we're clear on that. Full composite jams, they have one major issue. When they heat up, they do what? They, it's like a noodle. They're very, very flexible, and they'll just move all over the place because of what it is. So if you look at this piece, this is a full composite jam, right? You see it on the edge, it's cellular PVC. Why do you think they do this? I had a guy yesterday say water. There better not be water here. <laughs> There's water inside, we've got issues. It's not for water, it's for strength. They're trying to fortify this piece to keep it from moving. You look at composite decking, it's the same way. The underside of most composite deckings are all louvered like this. Same exact principle. They're trying to add strength to it because they know as soon as it heats up, it's very flexible, it's very non Okay? So knowing that, how would you think the install would change? Wow. So remember we were talking, one, two, three install screws, right? One, two, three install screws, right? So six on that unit and that unit, with the exception because this is a French door, you got two up here, right? So six, eight, how many? How many would you guess will go in this one? Four on the Every four to six inches, there must be a screw and there must be a shin pack. So here's how I set composite frames when I, when I do them. I do my one, two, three, right? No different than I did with those frames because I'm gonna set my squareness, plumbness, and levelness off the top and bottom screws, right? On my hinge side first. The center screw I don't do anything with right away. Then I move to the other side and I do the same thing, okay? Then I come back to this side and I've got my three holes already drilled in here and I'm gonna put at least three more in, in between this screw and this screw. So I'm going to go one, two, three. Follow what I'm saying? With shims behind it. 
to stop that frame from doing this. Because guess what happens if that frame starts moving like that? What else does it affect? It affects everything. It's gonna start pushing this side light over. It's gonna start pushing this door. It's gonna start moving everything. Now things are gonna start hitting that weren't hitting before. And unfortunately for you guys here, how big are your temperature swings? So in the morning, it may be perfectly fine, and it works great. You late afternoon and no longer, nothing opens. Or you can't close it. Try to close up the house, now it's getting hot out, and it won't close. So, three more here, three more here, on both sides. Four to six inches. Composite frames must be installed that way. If they're not, you're gonna have a service nightmare. Okay, I'm not trying to deter you from composite. Composite is extremely nice. It, the longevity behind it is, is amazing. However, you just have to understand the installation process is different from this to that. Okay? You asked about those vinyl jams that I could Yep. So, vinyl jams, vinyl technically is supposed to be installed the same way. There are some out there, depending on which ones they buy, that will have a, a metal reinforcement in it, which of course those won't have to be because there's a lot more rigidness inside of that frame. It'd be very similar to a wood frame at that point. Okay? If it's just a straight um, cellular PVC or if it's a straight extruded vinyl, they will still recommend that you have more than three fasteners in there. Uh, you may not have to go as many, but I do. It was me. Better safe than sorry. I don't want you to have to go back. Right? Which always is why, and I always talk about it here. Everybody always asks me why the door industries still use finger-jointed pine frames, right? Because it's cheap. And it, people think that it's, that it's an expensive product. What benefit is there? You just talked about it. It's massively strong, actually, right? I got six screws in this, or I'm going to have 12 to 14 in that. Okay? Yeah, it may not last as long because it is susceptible to damage, water damage, rot. But in terms of strength, I have strength here where I don't care, without the fasteners. Right. Why would you use the composite Why would you use a composite rather than a, a frame? Yeah. So here's where that scenario usually comes into play. You're out replacing a door or selling a door, trying to measure a door, and you're replacing it because their frame is completely rotten. Maybe there's absolutely no overhang, they're on the coast, they're getting beat up by all this weather, right? And you know, this is wood. If they don't keep up on maintenance, which we know everybody keeps up on maintenance, <laughs> without question. Yeah. Uh -huh. If they don't keep up on maintenance, you know you're, they're gonna be in the same boat again with this frame, right? It, it, not a matter of if, it's a matter of when, it will happen, right? With this one, yeah, maybe they might maintain it, but if they don't, is it going to hurt? It's not going to rot out, right? There is a cost difference between the two, right? This one's more expensive. That's why, right? So just keep that in the back of your mind. Composite's great. It must be installed properly. Otherwise, you're going to be servicing it and servicing it and servicing it. And probably be cursing us. Is it has nothing to do with me? <laughs> All right. So back to this door. So we always start with the hinge side. Top and bottom first. Does anybody realize that I have not talked about shims on the side of the door yet? Any questioning on why? Remember I talked about the shanked screws, right? I put my screws in first. The reason why I put my screws in first after I set my plumbness what is the number one complaint on shims from most installers? Or why they want composite? They break. If you put a screw through these, guess what happens to them? They completely fall apart, right? So, they curse these. They would rather have the composites, because you put a screw through composite, what happens? It goes right through. <coughs> the issue is composites, composites expensive. Most owners of that particular location or branch or whatever, they want to pay for that. Yeah, it's not a lot per shim when you break it apart, but in the grand scheme of things, and they're installing a few hundred doors a year, okay, yeah, it's, it's starting to add up, right? So they'll always send these. They're much cheaper. So here's a way around that. 
using the shank screws and putting them in and not tightening the frame down yet. Now we can utilize those screws and set the shims on the top of the screws. No longer will those shims fall down. No longer are they going to crack on you. And now I can make all my adjustments that I need because of the shank. Follow what I'm saying? And you do it on all three positions. Make sense? This is why I install this way. I spend less time. I'm not worrying about things falling. I've got support. I'm good. Once I'm done here, we already talked about it a little bit with the other door. How much work do you think I need to do over here? Not a lot. Usually what I do is I'll check for plumbness here. And if I'm plumb, I'll go ahead and run these screws in enough to hold it. I'll open the door. open the door Bear with me. <laughs> I'll check my reveals across the top and the side if they are right I'll put my shim packs in screw these down then I move to my center two screws and I do the exact same thing keeping it nice and straight put my shim packs in tighten them down make sense Did you help me? Step. They put the top of the door. Now we open the door. All right. Any questions on shimming? Any questions on how you install the door? Where to position the screws? How we position the screws? We're good? Clear? All right. I need everyone up here. Everything else from this point forward um, are a lot of pitfalls that we see or a lot of steps that we, we see get forgotten or neglected or maybe just not done right. Maybe they tried to do it, but it wasn't 100% correct. And the, the sill that's over there on that French door is an actual Thermatrue sill. That is our sill. This one here is an Endura sill. Both of these are fully adjustable. Those caps do pop off. And underneath them, there are screw bosses or screws on this other side that actually allow this cap to move up and down within the sill, okay? We all understand what that's doing for us, right? It's adjusting the tightness of the sweep on the actual cap, basically sealing off the bottom of the door, okay? When fabrication puts these together, they typically will send this all the way down. And they do that because they don't know where it's going to end up when you're done installing, okay? So if you don't follow all the steps that I've talked about to this point, this gives you some forgiveness. It allows for some mistakes during your installation process. I'm not saying that the door is still going to op operate properly, but this will at least allow you to seal it because you can move this independently, left, right, center. You can flex it, all kinds of things, right? That's why those screws are very important. So the first thing I want to talk about here is how to properly adjust this. There is actually a test for that, and Thermatrue actually has a YouTube video on this. Um, it's called the dollar bill test. When our engineers took, took a look at this and were designing this, our test is actually to take a dollar bill and place it on top of each one of these screw bosses and that dollar bill sets the perfect tolerance to the perfect level between the sweep and that cap. The thickness of a dollar bill is what we want. Okay, And what I mean by that you set your dollar bill on top, you close the door on top of it, you grab a hold of the bill and you try and pull it out. 
if it if you could basically blow it out, you know you're way too low and you bring the sill up or the cap up, right? If you're pulling and pulling and pulling and it feels like it's gonna tear, you're too tight. Open the door up, take it down a, a turn or two, right? And keep going. What you're looking for is that nice resistance without it feeling like it's going to tear. You want that on top of every single screw. So if you have like a French door like that, when you see that there's more than four screws over there, right? Mm -hmm. You can have six, eight, ten, depending on the size of the unit, it's going to determine how many screws you have. Each one of those will, will move independently. The one cautionary thing I will tell you is do not use a screw gun to try and do this. It has to be by hand, okay, first and foremost, because what I see a lot of guys do is they'll... They know they're all the way down, so they take a screw gun and they, they run this way up and that cracks here. You have to do them evenly, especially if you're going to go up quite a ways. Okay? How Otherwise, high will that go up? I'm sorry. Yeah, How high will it go up? It goes up roughly half inch. Half inch. Um, I hope you never have to go up that high. <laughs> <laughs> but there is, there is quite a bit of movement in them. Um, but... You should never have to go up that high, but you you got to make sure you got to be careful. Move those consistently with each other. The other thing, if you're dealing with the thermatru sill, and you'll see it on that one, a couple differences with that is we use a stainless steel screw. We've been talking about stainless steel screws, right? What's the be benefit to them? They don't rust. What's the downside to them? The heads are soft. They're soft, yeah. right? Our engineers decided that it was a great idea to go ahead and use a number three screw on that cap. Number three Phillips. Everybody know what I mean by that? It's bigger, yeah. right? What happens if you put a number two Phillips in that? Strip it. You strip it, you'll create burrs. The metal's soft, so it'll, it'll create burrs that pop up on top. You slide, slide the door across it. What happens then? You just torn the sweep off the bottom of the door, or you're at least cutting it, right? have to use a number three Phillips hand screwdriver to adjust that. I'm trying to get them right now to change that over to a Torx bit. Torx, very difficult to strip Torx. Right? And our idea or our thought, thought process behind a number three was that a homeowner wouldn't have a number three, so they're not gonna mess with it, right? <laughs> Unfortunately, they have a number two <laughs> and they mess with it, right? And then it creates an issue, right? So it's it's very important. We need to follow that. Use a number three, adjust that appropriately, and then move to the next step. Okay. These are also number number threes. These are zinc dichromate screws. They don't mar as easy, of course. They're a much harder screw. Um, I would say the only issue with a zinc dichromate is they, they well if they get wet or wet enough they will actually seize or weld to each other, okay? Which is another reason why we use stainless. Both systems though, lefty-loosey, righty-tighty, everybody knows that phrase, right? Lefty-loosey will actually rise or raise the sill, righty-tighty will lower it. It's a mechanical movement. We're not relying on any springs, we're not relying on any anything to move that for you, it's an actual mechanical movement that's going to move that product. Okay? The benefit behind that is, well, it's mechanical. Nothing else is going to affect it. Okay? Very important that that is adjusted properly. Once that is adjusted, anybody want to guess what's next? Weather stripping. What do I have to do with weather stripping? Weather stripping's already in. Weather stripping will be cut long, purposely. Okay? When you're done adjusting this cap, these legs of weather stripping should be level with the cap. Wherever the cap ends up, see how there's this nice big hole underneath right. here? Yeah. That hole better be there. And it better not get filled. We want the hole. Okay. See how the weather stripping is perfectly level with that cap? This throws everything off if you don't do this. If you have a bunch of leaking doors out there or doors that have rot on the edge, 
guarantee you this is why. This and the corner pads, which is where I'm going next. This would be why. Very rarely are these getting done properly. We ship them long because we don't know where this is going to end up. So we don't want to guess and then make it too short. Because now you need a new piece of weather stripping for that $8,000 door. Right? Because now it's going to leak. Okay? So make sure that we're doing this. Adjust the cap, cut the sweep, cut the, uh, the weather stripping. Then we move on to the corner pads. Everybody knows what I mean by corner pads, right? You know this nice beautiful little packet that comes attached to the side of every single door that has the beautiful thermature written instructions that nobody ever reads and usually either get left inside here or thrown in the trash, right? Yeah. That's what we see all the time. Inside here are the instructions, there are some screws in here, and then of course the corner pads are in here. Okay. Very, very important that you actually get this off the edge of the door before it goes into the opening. Very, very important that we are utilizing the pads that are inside here. Okay, so the corner seal pads. You're going to see a couple different versions. I'm going to show you the one first, but I'm going to speak to the other one um, more because it's, it's much more important for you to understand why we develop these new ones. Here's a traditional corner pad, right? Remember to even use these a long time ago. Um, we've actually since changed our pads to these, which I'll get to in a minute. Bare minimum, you have to have something down here in the corners. Bare minimum. Do not forget these. If this is all you got, fine, great. Get it down here. I would prefer, though, that you use these. These are new. They're called 7 Series pads. Anybody guess why we call them 7s? The shape like not an L. 7. <laughs> right? Why? Why? Everybody was asked that. Why oh, you guys got to go mess with things? I was fine the way it was. No, it wasn't. Right? Remember I was talking about water? And the bottoms of the doors getting black or rotten. Right? There's a reason behind that. And this is the easiest way to explain it. Where'd that jam piece go? Right away. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> All right. So the way I've always or been explaining it for the past couple years anyway, is if you look at a cutaway of the jam with the weather stripping in it, and I would... Hold this kind of closed a little bit because the door is on this, right? The door is coming against this compression weather stripping. On the back side, you see this nice, perfect little hole, right? There's a hole back here. If you think outside the box, what does that kind of look like? The hole. A straw, right? Would you agree? A straw. So, set the door up. The door is closing up against this, right? Every time that door closes, what do you think is happening on the back side in that hole with that straw? What do you think is happening? Every time you close that door? Smaller. Which does what? When you make something smaller, it creates a vacuum or it pushes, right? One way or the other, it's going to do something. Because there's air trapped in there, it's going to push or it's going to draw, right? So every time you close that door, it's actually a straw that's creating a vacuum on the bottom side of the sill. So it's drawing or sucking water up. Any water that's down there on the bottom is being drawn up. Okay, so think about it this way. You take a straw, you put it in a glass, you suck on it, what happens? I'm not trying to be stupid. <laughs> you get whatever you're drinking, right? Take the same straw, just stick it in the same glass, but cut a slit in the straw just above the water line, what happens? Nothing. You get air, right? Nothing happens. You're not going to draw anything up that straw anymore, right? So, the 7 Series pad what that is designed to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thought I put it in my back pocket. The 7 Series pad is exactly designed to do that. It took our engineers two years to make these. And I know this sounds stupid and it sounds funny and everybody always laughs, but we've had a massive issue since the dawn of time, since we started using the pads, with water. Because nobody would ever cut the, the weather stripping the way it was supposed to be cut. Okay, so. We took it upon ourselves. What else can we do to try and stop this from happening? So, yeah, it may have taken them a while to do it, but they're extremely smart people, and they know what they're doing. It's just how do we do it and how do we get it to work properly, okay? So basically what they have done is this 7 is going to create a 
when the door closes, it's going to create that slit in the scroll. See that? Every time that door opens and closes, it's going to create that slit. Stops the draw. Okay. If it was the old traditional pad, every time it closed, it kind of sealed it, and it created more of a drag. And then the water would come up the weather stripping, come down the top of, of the pad, saturate the pad, mm -hmm. and now you got water sitting against the edge of the door because the pad's soaked. Right? It's a problem. This stops it. The other thing you'll notice, we try to do this to make it so installation would be done right every single time. This part of the pad is cut to match the cap in terms of its size. On the thermometer side, so not the endo. You'll notice it's actually a little bit bigger than the endo. So. Okay. We still re require or hope that you put a small bead of caulk at this corner. So when you're putting this in, you set it down into that caulking and you roll it into place. I always remove the weather stripping to do that because one of the other things we changed on this pad was the adhesive property on the back. I'm sure you guys have run into a situation where the old pads were installed, the old square pads, and they've kind of come off after time or they've gotten wet and the adhesion kind of let go. Yeah, well, that ain't gonna happen anymore. We changed the adhesion property. If you actually stick this on here now and try and pull it off, you'll take wood with you. It's a lot stronger, a lot stronger. So you get one attempt at putting it on. Okay, that's why I always say no different than when we were installing the door, rolling the door in, roll the pad in. Okay, and it will always set like this. They are directional, so there is a left and there is a right. Okay. Questions to this point? Make sure the weather stripping gets cut. Do not fill the hole down at the bottom. I had some installers that started doing this. They, they still fought me and said, oh, that's wrong. I don't want that gap there. So they take silicone and caulk it closed. Well, now you just stopped. You just created a dam. Any water that is getting back behind there is staying there. Right? I don't want it there. I want it going. Leave the hole. The hole stays. Both sides. You may, you may have to explain it to a homeowner. They may see it. They may question it. But you explain the process and the thought behind it. This is, what's, this is what it's designed to do. Both sides have to be done that way. Once those are adjusted, what's next? The next position that I always go to is what else is in that packet. You got some bigger screws, right? Anybody want to guess why these screws are in here? They're not installation screws. Hinges. For hinges. Why, why, why do we care about that? You need at least one long screw and one individual hinge. What does that do? More support. Just because we said hinges. so? <laughs> Security. Security. People can't take the door away. <laughs> so, so here's a funny, funny factoid, right? So what, my neighbor is a uh, firefighter for the city that I live in. And uh, him and I, we, of course, I'm a door geek, so I talk about doors all the time. <laughs> Um, we were talking about doors one day, and, and he's like, you know, it's great because I always hit the hinge side if I need to come into a door. I'm like, what? Really? He's like, yeah, nobody ever installs a door right. He, he used to do side jobs, side work, like insurance work, mm -hmm. restoration and stuff like that on his days off from the fire house. Um, but he, that's what he was talking about. Is everyone, all firefighters are trained to hit the hinge side of a door. Why? Well, if you think about it. Small screws. There's your hinge screws. <laughs> That's it. Is this side designed for impact? Most definitely. This entire side of this door is designed for impact. That's what strike plates do. That's what hardware does. If the, if the door has multi-point like this one does, yeah. This whole jam leg is designed <clears throat> to take a hit and not break. Right? Is this side designed to take a hit? Not with these in there. Right? So if you follow the installation instructions, you know that nobody reads that everybody throws away. Um, inside here, it actually talks about the top hinge. We do a couple things with the hinges that most other manufacturers don't. This would be one of them. So the top hinge, the two outermost hinge holes are supposed to get two and a half to three inch screws, which go through the, the, the jam and into the stub. So now, 
my fire my firefighter buddy hates this, but now if he wants to try and hit the side, yeah, good luck. It's not coming in. You have to take the whole wall with you because the stud's now attached, right? So he doesn't like it very much, but yeah. Actually, his response to me was, I'll just go through the wall. It's easier. Think about it. It's just sheeting and subsiding. Right? It's easy. Much easier than the door at that point. So the top two should have the screws in it. It, it does two things, security and weight. How heavy are our doors? Especially if they're a full light door. Especially if they have decorative glass in them. They can get really heavy really fast, right? Where's all the weight gonna pull from? We talked about this already, installs, right? You always start at the hinge side because the weight's there. We wanna make sure that that top hinge doesn't loosen and all that weight is being pulled off of that hinge first. It's always gonna come from the top first, gravity. Go figure. So take those top two screws out towards the outermost profile. Install your longer screws, angling them towards the outside. These particular screws are black to match the hinges that are on this door. That's usually what they do. They'll try and color match the, the screws, I'm sorry, to whatever the hinges that, that's on that particular unit. Okay. Very important, at least those get done. If you want to be a top-notch installer, you can go above and beyond. Do at least one and one or two and two on all three. Because guess what? Nothing's coming through that hinge side at that point. You basically just did the same thing that we're doing over here with all the strikes. Make sense? While we're on the hinges, does anybody ever notice what we do differently with our hinges than any other manufacturer out there? Yeah, the pins are up a little bit. I don't know why they're up. That's not it. <laughs> What's that? Security tabs. Uh, those, those actually aren't security tabs. Those are for production. They're, uh, they're self-aligning tabs to keep everything straight, straight and square, um, trying to make their lives easier from our side. Um, we pocket more to solve our hinges. Everybody know what I mean by that? No. You ever rub? Our hinges do not sit proud. They are set down inside of the door. So they're flush. Why would we require ore pack or any fabricator to do this? It's an extra tool, it's an extra step. If those bits are dull, especially as they're running through the edge of the door, that's a pretty thin piece of wood, right? Has anybody ever used a router in here with a dull bit? What will happen if it's dull and you're going through a, a thin piece of wood? It'll blow it out, won't it? So if that bit's dull and they hit this corner, it's gonna chip out the entire edge of that door. What's, can I fix that? Can they fix that? No, it's a new slab. That's a problem, right? So this is an expense. Actually, a pretty massive expense when you start to think about everything that goes into it. So why would we require this? Strength, security. Think about mechanical fasteners. What, is a, what does a mechanical fastener do over time? Over use and time, just expansion contraction. It loosens, right? It will loosen. We know that these screws will loosen over time. So by having the hinges inside of a pocket, what does that provide us? That hinge plate isn't gonna move because it's in a pocket, even if those screws loosen up a little bit. Now, if they fall out, that's a whole different story. Right? If they come completely out, that's a problem. But it, it provides us a much more secure system. Okay? The downside to doing this, and you guys have probably heard this, and I'm, I'm just going to point it out so you know, and you know how to, how to answer the question. Remember I was talking about reveals earlier across the top and the latch side of the door during the install? Why did I not say anything about the hinge side? It's, it's not moving. Hmm? <laughs> They're set in place. So. They are set That's in place. It. There's nothing I can do about yeah. it, right? The hinges are going to set that reveal. But if you've ever noticed, if you close this door right now, your reveal is much tighter on the hinge side than it ever will be here or yeah, here. Because they're set in so you don't Because get we gap. pocketed the hinges, yeah. right? Most manufacturers will, will face mount hinges, which gives them the same reveal all the way around the door, but they don't get the security or the strength. It's cheaper, it's easier, right? So I have had customers, especially in the r, &R channel, complain about the gap being so much bigger over here than it is over here. That's why. Pocket mortise our hinges, and you can go into the whole story on what we're doing, and what we're trying to accomplish by doing that. Yes, it's going to change the reveal. I can't do anything about that. 
Make sense? Okay. All right. Hinges are in, uh, screws are in the hinges, weather stripping, corner pads, sill is all adjusted. What do we want to talk about next? What do we want to do? Okay. Next would be your strike plate. This particular door has a multi-point in it. Okay. So we want to, I want to talk about multi-point with this, and then we're going to transition over to the door with the two vented side lights. I want to talk a little bit about um, a standard handle set as well. But first, I want to cover the multi-points. So the multi-points first. So within the multi-point, another package that you're going to get is this one here. This one here has all the strike plates for both the main lock and the tongues and or the chute bolts. That particular door, the French door, has a chute bolt version. Everybody understands that that multi-point can come in one of two ways, right? A chute or a tongue. The tongue comes out the side, the chute comes out the top and the bottom. There is an application for each one of them. You cannot use a tongue version on a French door. We do not want those tongues going into the astrical. I'd rather have the chute bolt version because then it goes into the head and the sill. Make sense? On a single door, I would rather have you use this version because the plates get kind of tight up here if you want to try and do a chute bolt on a single door. Make sense? So on a tongue version, you'll get this nice beautiful packet. Again, installation instructions are all in here. Nobody ever reads those. But a couple little pitfalls here. Besides dropping it. So most guys throw these away. Please don't throw these away. They are actually designed to set in here. And right there is the reason why they throw them away. See how it's sitting proud? Because it's actually hitting the stud. Right? These need to be in here. If you're that tight, then take a, uh, a multi-tool or a couple drill bits, a bit larger drill bits, and drill that stud out a little bit so these can set down inside. These pockets are designed for this to set completely flush inside here. You, if you take a close look at it, you'll actually see there's a router and there's another one mm -hmm. even deeper. It's for this lip of this cap. Okay? All of them have that. Every single hole has one. Okay? For this particular deal. So I don't have my multi tool. I'm going to leave them out. Because it's hitting stuff. Once those are in position, that's when you pull out the actual strike plates themselves. Everybody's pretty aware that this is the main strike plate, right? This one goes dead center. And everybody understands that it has to go this way. It cannot go this way. <laughs> if you do it this way, it's going to nightmare, right? It has to go this way, and it is pocket mortise again to fit this so it's nice and flush. Top and bottoms have their own, and you notice that they're not perfect either. And we want to guess which way these go. Is there a direction to these? That way. Do they go this way or this way? That way. This way? Why? That little notch on the side. What does it do? The tongue latch, it's tapered, right? So as it engages, it'll hit that and it'll push the door against the weather stripping. If you put it this way, it doesn't do that. All right? They always go this way. So that extra knob, if you want to call it, always goes towards the inside of the house, if it's an in-swing door. Make sense? notice that these screws are two and a half inches long. If you remember
remember we were talking about earlier, right, doing that with the hinge side. Mm -hmm. Remember, this is all designed to take that impact. Those screws are all going into that jack stud. If you have the multi-point, you actually have two, five, seven, plus your install screws of three. You have 10 screws going through this jam and into that stud. It's a very, very, very secure system. Strike plates are in and we're going to move on to the multi-point. A couple things with the multi-point. Um, how many of you guys have, have been selling them, first and foremost? Are we selling any of them? Very rarely. That's Very rarely? Yeah. Okay. Um, any particular reason why? Cost? Cost, yeah. Okay. Um, one of the things on cost, especially since we've got a couple sales guys in here um, that I always talk about, the, the major mistake a lot of sales folks make with the multi-point <clears throat> is they try and go from nothing to the multi-point. And that's not fair to the multi-point, if you think about it, right? You have to have something first and foremost. There has to be a handle set. So if you take that $200 and you subtract that from the cost of the multi-point, how does the multi-point look now? Okay, what is the features and benefits from one to the other? More security. Right? More security. But the cardinal rule or the cardinal mistake that everybody makes is going from nothing, no hardware, mm -hmm. to multi-point, and they look at that $500 or $400 or whatever it is that you're charging for it, and they're like, I'm not spending that on a hardware mm -hmm. set, right? Well, you have to have something. So when I sold in the home, I always started with the standard knob and deadbolt, which is what's on the far door, right? right. 50, 60 bucks for that set, right? Maybe 75, right? I would transition them from that to a D handle, the decorative handle, the one that has the, the kind of curve to it, which is what, almost 200 for that one? And then I would transition from that to the multi-point. I'm taking that cost, adding it all together, and taking it off the price of the multi-point, even though I'm not. Logically, when they think about it, they're like, well, that's not, it's a $200 upgrade, mm -hmm. right? And what am I getting for that $200? Multiple points of contact, you're getting all the install screws going through the jam into the, into the, the jack stud, right? Or seal the door. Security, it's gonna seal the door tighter against the weather stripping. What is that worth? See what I'm saying? So usually that's what I always hear is multi-point's way too expensive. <clears throat> well, yeah, it's, it's gonna be expensive if you go from nothing to it. But customers that are gonna buy multi-point aren't gonna go from nothing to it. It's usually going to be that 200, 250, $300 handle set is what they're already considering mm -hmm. to the multi-point. Follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that's why I asked that question. So one of the other things that we have with multi-point is there's a couple uh, kind of pitfalls within it. If you don't understand exactly how the system works and you open up one of the boxes, there's a lot of parts and pieces inside of it, right? So that's what I want to cover now, or I want to cover within this door. So this is the box that will come with the handle set. The mortise, remember we were talking about pocket mortising the hinges? This system is all pocket mortised into the edge of the door. That portion will already be installed for you. Okay. All the screws will be in there. It's all stainless steel. It's a very, very nice system. It's all encased. encased sorry. It reminds you of a mortised storm door handle set from like a large center or something like that, right? Where it all comes inside the door. You don't see any of that. So the only part you see is what basically is right here. It's in the box. That's why it's in a box. So it doesn't so what happens if something malfunctions on the mortise lock? Do you have to rip? Do you have to replace the whole slab? Nope. You have to nope. It's all screwed in okay. from the edge. So if something does break on there for some reason, which we'll get into what does break in there um, and why, it can all be unscrewed, pulled out of the edge of the door, and a new one be put in. So it is fully removable and replaceable. Okay? Great question. Um, so as we start to move forward on the, on the latch itself, I always tell people to unpackage, unpackage the handle itself to make sure that you have everything. And what I mean by everything, Remember I told you there's a lot of parts and pieces. There'll be two bars. They are split. They are separate. Okay. Um, make sure those are in there. You should have an inside and outside handle set. You should have a deadbolt. It looks very similar to this. It'll even look like this at this moment. You should have the keys for that. I can grab this stuff. You should have two Allen wrenches silver and a black. One will be much thicker than the other. You should 
should have three of one color screw, depending on the color of the hardware, but you should have three of one colored screw and one silver screw or stainless steel screw. Okay. You should have two nylon bushings. Like I said, a lot of parts and pieces, right? You should have two pointed, almost dart-like set screws. Should be two of them. The inside and the outside plates and gaskets. If you ever notice, like Baldwin, for instance, Baldwin is one of the higher end hardware manufacturers out there. Every one of their hardware sets comes with a gasket. You guys don't have to worry about it here so much because you don't get all the cold, right? But as you go north or as you go east and it gets really cold, this stops that cold transfer from coming through the handles. Because in my part of the world, in Ohio, right, one of the biggest things we have to deal with is during the winter, if you have a humidifier in your house, which is pumping moisture into your house, it'll actually rust the screws of the hardware set because the cold is transferring through. And what does cold metal do? It attracts moisture. Right, so the moisture sits on there and then rusts it. So it's a problem. So this will stop that. Okay. And the very last tool that will be in that box is probably the most important one, and everybody always questions what the heck it is, and that's this little tiny ring with a little bend on it. Do not lose this. Do not throw this away. Do not leave this with the homeowner. We'll explain to you what this is here in a second. Okay? Very important piece. It will be in there, I promise. Okay. So the first place that you want to start, and then you guys can all see, I wish I could turn this around is the actual edge of the door. On the edge of the door, I'll just use this to show you. On the edge of the door, you will see this big silver strip. You will see this latch. You will not see this yet. This will be pushed in. There'll be a sticker over it with a little black plastic plug. Okay? You have to remove the sticker and remove the black plastic plug. Just take your fingernails and actually pull it out. Now, Nine times out of 10, this is where everybody starts to get tripped up by this hardware set. It'll look like this right here. Does anybody see an issue with that? You just said it. Yeah. These two are backwards from one another. Right. That's a problem, isn't it? Yeah. Because if I go to close this door, what's gonna happen? This is gonna hit, and it's not gonna compress. Right? Everybody with me? You see that back there? <laughs> with me right the great thing about this multi-point lock system it's completely universal switch Just turn you grab a hold of this you pull out and you spin it you do the same thing with this one up here this one's a lot harder usually you have to have a pair of pliers to do it but it is designed to pull out and spin and become the other direction so it's tapered the same way and it latches into the strike plates like it's supposed to Make sense? 100% universal. So no matter how they put it in here, doesn't matter. You don't have to take it out and try and flip it over or anything. No, let it alone. <laughs> Just move the pins themselves. Okay, that's step one. You need to take that sticker off. You need to take that black plastic pin out. Just a little cap. I'll show you what one looks like. There's the little tiny cap. All this is doing is holding that little safety catch all it's doing is holding this thing in so during shipping it doesn't get damaged right. the other thing that this does what what purpose does this serve you guys know what that little thing serves not the black one this one what does this serve it creates a lot of headache i'll tell you that or what is it protecting it if this is not depressed, this lock set will not actuate. Once it's depressed, you can engage it, whether it's the tongue or the shoe. So thinking about that, what does that help us or help the homeowner not do? They can't mess with it. If it's open and they mess with the handle and they engage this shoot bolt and go to shut the door, where's it going to hit? Uh, yeah. <laughs> It's going to hit the frame and put a big old dent in it. Right. Or they're trimmed. And they're going to 
curse us because we're, how dare you, right? So it must be depressed in order for that to actuate. So if the door's not closed, they would have to physically push this themselves to be able to do that. Make sense? So during shipping, we put the plug in so we can lock it. Hopefully that will help keep that door closed during the shipping process. But during the install process, it, it must be removed. We do not want that to stay in there because guess what will happen? Somebody will engage the lock set and try and close the door and damage the frame. Okay, so that's step one. Step two then is the deadbolt. Um, especially with you guys here. How to do this. Next step is the actual deadbolt itself. Now this is the way I like to do it. With this door, This hole right here where this screw is will be empty from the factory. So if you look at the edge of this one right now, this screw is not in there, which is where this screw comes from, okay? This screw is what holds this deadbolt in place. I let me see the hole down here. So this screw goes through the edge and into this and screws it together, okay? So that's what I'm going to do to this handle set, but I wanted to kind of show you on here what it actually looks like. Now, everybody always questions me on what that little ring's for, right? Try and turn that so that ends up, you can use this, so that ends up down in here. Can't. You can't. This is a safety mechanism, right? So nobody can actually take this out once it's installed, okay? If you ever look, right on the very edge, just underneath where the turn knob is, there's a little tiny slit in that metal. See it in there? This beautiful little ring goes inside there and you pull down. Once you pull down, grab it. And now I was able to turn it. You have to be able to turn it and engage it in that position there to be able to slide it into the mortise. If it's in the other position, you'll never get it in there. Okay? I will tell you that this is exactly how I do it. You notice my face plates are not on this door. I put this in first. The reason why I put this in first is because if these plates are on and you try and slide this through, what are you hitting? the outside face of the plate, right? It takes the, you now have a potential of scratching now. So I do this first, and then I'll slide this over it. Every, well, you can't, because that's on there, right? It doesn't fit. I'll show you. <laughs> right, so this always goes in first. So that slides in, you slide it in. It'll be about halfway into the opening or half, halfway into the, the mortise. And then I start to try and turn that deadbolt lever on the inside, this little one here. Right, I start jiggling it. Why am I trying to jiggle it? Because I want it to relatch inside of the mortise. Remember how we had to turn that black piece to make it level or inside? I want it now to go come back out, right? So I'm gonna keep doing this and keep pushing until I feel it starting to turn. Make sense? Once that has happened, <clears throat> That's when you take your stainless steel screw. You notice this is a machined screw for metal. And there is a little, um, I guess, kind of like a little nipple on, so on the top of here. That is to help stop you from cross-threading it. You cross-thread it, it's a problem, right? It's ruined. You've ruined the, the actual deadbolt and the screw, and then good luck getting it back apart. Okay? I always recommend, folks, when you put this in, you do it by hand first. Do you have a pair of pliers? Remember, it goes in the edge of the door, no different than that one there. Remember I showed you where that screw lives? The hole is open, or, uh, open right now on this one. It goes in the edge of the door. Start it by hand. I always go about 10 to 15 threads before I stop. Then I will grab a normal drill. 
And everybody understands that there's a clutch on an on a electric drill now, right? There's a fast and a slow speed. I always make sure I turn it down to the slower speed. I do not want to just dumb this home, right? Go slow, take your time, do it right. Very expensive lock step, right? We were already talking about that. We don't want to mess it up. Go slow, torque it in. Remember, it is a stainless steel screw. We talked about it with the, with the sill. You can't strip it out. You can create burrs. Be very careful. It is a Phillips bit, right? The very next thing that I do is take the tiny little silver Allen wrench. This is what will take this little turn knob off. You'll see that there is a little set screw on the back side of it. That's what this little one's for is to actually take that set screw out. Why am I taking this out? Or off. So I can put the plate on because now I'm protected. Everything else that goes on will not damage this plate. Or if I'm trying to fiddle with that thing, it could, right? Some guys will fight me on that and say, well, I, I always put the plates on first and I want to put that in grain. But if you scratch it, especially if somebody paid $500 for that lock set. Thank you, sir. I just had to do that with this one. <laughs> I just needed pliers for it. I couldn't get it with my fingers. Um, so, now when you take this off, the set screw will be almost completely out. So be very, very careful so it doesn't fall out and you lose it, right? When you go to put it back on, there is a, a divot in the bar that this goes on to, okay? It's very obvious where that set screw goes. If you try and put it on wrong, it'll actually sit there and just spin around in circles until that hits that divot. This screw should be completely buried. You should not be able to see it at all when it's installed right because it should be all the way down inside that little divot in the rod, okay? which adds the strength and keeps it from, from moving or shifting. I'm going to leave these off for right now just because I don't want to take up a bunch of time. There is an inside and outside of these plates. Please, please, please do not put this outside. <laughs> See, um, they can get to the screws and take it off. So they still can't unlock it, but they can take it off and try it. Um, this is the inside plate. This is the outside plate. Everything is always going to be mortised out to receive both plates. That's what all these holes are for that go down the, the, the face of the door, both inside and outside. Um, <clears throat> I always put these on next. So I'm going to do that right now real quick. You notice when I put that plate on, right, I had to kind of jiggle it around, which is why I was talking about scratching the face. If I scratch the back side of this, who cares? You'll never see it. I do the same thing with these screws. I will tighten them by hand um, a good five or six turns before I actually try and take a screwdriver or a screw gun into it. Now those pads would have been on. Yes, they go behind these plates just to seal them off. I'm just trying to be quicker. Okay. Oh, I will take this, this moment to point out, I have seen this once. Remember I was talking about impact guns and how much I love them? <laughs> or not? Um, I have seen an installer use an impact gun on this multi-point and he actually sat there and he was cranking it down and it kept going. It was, it was impacting on the screw, right? It actually pulled the aluminum or pulled the screw pocket off the outside plate. So there's a nice big hole in the plate because it just busted it through, right? Again, why I don't like impacts. There's purposes, reasons, applications for them. Doors are not one of them, okay? All right. Now that, that the plates are on, that's when I go back to the deadbolt, I'll put it, or the throw, I'll put it back on real quick. Okay. 
the very next one is the one that everyone always gets wrong. Inside of this box, there is a split rod. So it's two pieces, right? They cannot go like this. They have to go like this. So they'll look like that. Okay. And then on the actual handle set themselves, you'll see the big set screw, which remember I was telling you those, those almost dark looking set screws, that's what's gonna go in here. This, this slit on top with the hole just underneath is what goes to the hole for the set screw and the handle. Follow what I'm saying? So you see how that, that hole is up top, which is gonna to point towards the hole that's in the handle, okay? Follow what I'm saying? If you do not follow this procedure, you do not do this, you'll curse the handle. Um, the set screw will not drop inside here. It's designed this way, so when you pierce this, remember the dark looking tip to it, will actually penetrate this metal and go down into that little hole, which then secures this handle 100%. Okay? If you do it wrong, and you try and put it in backwards, I'm not gonna do it because I got one stuck last time I did this. Um, and I couldn't get it for And you try and set the set screw, it'll sit real proud, it'll sit way out, and it'll actually, the handle will pull off over time, okay? So very, very important that these are put in the right way. The instructions do tell you that, okay? Like I said, there's the, there's a little dark portion on the, the set screws, right? They go inside here, you tighten those down, and again, when you're done, these will actually set completely recessed. They should never sit proud like that. If they're setting like that and you've torqued and torqued and torqued, you've probably got this bar in wrong. Okay. I'm just going to take it down for now. The last two parts to this equation are these nylon spacers. These are extremely important. They're extremely important. They do two things. They take up some of the play that's within the handle set. One of the biggest complaints that I've ever gotten about a flare handle, even from Schlag or Baldwin or anybody, is it has a lot of movement in it, right? <laughs> this lock set's no different. If you do not put these in, you'll get some movement to it, right? Then the other complaint that I always get is the noise. It's metal on metal. So if they tighten these down and they put them all close together, like you're supposed to, that metal on metal contact you hear. So, I always put these in first. They actually, they'll actually fit kind of snug in here. So you kind of got to push them in. You could also, if you really wanted to, I'll do it on this side. You could put them on here and go ahead and insert this. And then it's going to take kind of a, a hit to actually knock it in place, okay? One other quick thing about these handles. They are actually designed to go this way. I've had lots of customers want them this way. It's okay. They're universal. If that's how they want them, so be it, okay? But this is how we design them. So this one goes out here. At this point, the lock shaft should be done, right? I usually will give the homeowner the two Allen wrenches. The reason being, the mechanical fasteners, right? What we learn about mechanical fasteners, they can loosen over time. Uh, most of the times, we will actually try and, or Hoppy will try and actually put a little bit of Loctite on those for us. Um, 
it's usually blue, and that's to try and help with that, right? It doesn't happen all the time, um, but we know that they will eventually loosen. I want them to be able to retighten those. I don't want you to have to go out there to tighten two set screws, right? They're ridiculous. We used to do it all the time. But at that point, you should be able to lock and close this door. Everything should engage, as long as you did everything else properly, right? Um, so I'm just going to... And everybody is fully aware, like we talked about earlier, to engage this lock set, you it does have to be closed, and you do have to lift. Once it's lifted, you can throw or actuate the deadbolt. Once the deadbolt is actuated, this will not unlock. Unless you use the key or you do it from the inside with the throw. Okay. Now, in terms of issues with this lock set. The biggest issue that I have seen is what we already were talking about a little bit, and that is customers not understanding open, close, that little tiny pin on the edge, and they don't have this unit fully latched, and they're trying to lift up on this handle, and they keep lifting, and they keep yanking, and they bend either the internal mechanism or the rod that goes through for the handles, and it bends a bunch of stuff inside. Right? I, can't, I can't fix it all, I can't make it so that stuff never happens. We just need to make them very much aware of how the system works. It must be closed, it must be closed fully. If you're trying to engage it outside of the opening, it's never gonna work, okay? Otherwise, it's a very, very sound system, very, very secure system, very high end.